Tonight's show and topic of discussion do not necessarily reflect the opinion of Spaced Out Radio, SOR Media, or its hosts. Listener discretion is advised. Here at Spaced Out Radio, we are about to take you higher. Broadcasting from the Rocky Mountains of Colorado to you listening around the world. Welcome to Spaced Out Saturdays on Spaced Out Radio. You can follow Tessa on our Facebook page at Spaced Out Radio. On Twitter at Tessa TNT. And you can subscribe to her YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio for our archives. Now broadcasting from our Mile High Radio Clubhouse on Spaced Out Saturdays with your host, Tessa Nicole Thomas. Good evening, Spaced Out Radio. Secure your tinfoil hats, buckle down tight, and hold on loosely as we soar over the rocky tops of the La Platas on a rocky mountain high, get sucked into the vortex of the Four Corners, and settle down snugly at mile marker 419.9 in colorful Colorado. It is Saturday, March 23rd, Sunday, March 24th for those of you on the East Coast and beyond, and this is Spaced Out Radio. Hope you guys are having a rockin' weekend so far. I am your host, Tessa TNT, and I am live tonight broadcasting from beautiful Bayfield, Colorado. We are 150,000 strong nightly on Spaced Out Radio Network, spacedoutradio.com, Spreaker, Paranormal Radio, TalkStream Live, as well as 99.1 FM WQEE in Noonan, Georgia, home of The Walking Dead, 107.7 UPRN in New Orleans, as well as Revolution Radio, KZFX-FM, and Deep Talk Radio, which you can find at deeptalkradio.com. Don't forget to peruse the Spaced Out Radio website, where you can find the encounter online, dealing with everything strange, paranormal, and odd, as well as finding some nice, cool SOR paranormal gear. Um, Tonight, I have a treat for all my guys and gals out there. Tonight, we will be talking to you and getting to know Mr. R.L. Poole. R.L. Poole has been researching Ed Leeds Skullman and the Coral Castle for more than 14 years. Using his unique mind and an uncanny ability to recognize and solve the riddles left behind by the brilliant and enigmatic Ed Leeds Skullman, R.L. keeps making discoveries on the topic which are only now starting to garner widespread mainstream attention and the recent publication of his number one new release for five straight weeks on the physics of gravity on Amazon. The Lead Skullman Codex, breakthroughs in understanding the Coral Castle, has cemented his reputation as the world's foremost expert on the subject of the Coral Castle. In addition to his popular YouTube videos on the subject, R.L. Poole's theories and discoveries have been featured in interviews with Boca Raton magazine, as well as appearance on Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie, then on Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie again by popular demand in 2019, Beyond Reality Radio, and has recently filmed an upcoming and yet-to-be-announced television special featuring his revolutionary discoveries about the Coral Castle by a major television network. Look for R.L. Poole at future lectures on upcoming television shows, radio interviews, and be sure to subscribe to his YouTube channel to stay up to date which you can find at youtube.com slash user slash talk to lead Skullman. R.L. Poole is a member of American Mensa and lives in Pennsylvania with his wife and son. R.L., I'm so excited you could be here. I know we scheduled last month, but you were whisked away to the television world. Um, But we rescheduled for the 23rd of this month. And I'm so excited that you're here tonight. Well, thank you very much, first of all, Tessa, for just inviting me to be on your program. I consider it an honor. And uh, if you don't mind a little bit of a feather in my cap. Um, <laughs> yes, I was I was whisked away into uh, 
an alternate reality uh, that they call television these days. And uh, it was a it was a, a very exciting thing to do. And, but I'm glad it's over with, and I'm I'm actually much prefer to be sitting here talking to you. I'm so glad. So how did that go? Um, your whole television debut was that exciting or paralyzing or <laughs> can you tell us a little more about that sure it was terrifying um it was it was a uh, anxiety creating for me i i was out of my depth i didn't know what to expect I was, you know an ingenue if you will in the ways of television and the delusions of grandeur that i had going into it were immediately shattered upon uh, my arrival um, but uh, it is not what you expect to be on television as I'm sure you know Tessa I'm sure you know <laughs> um, <laughs> but it is uh, maybe the least glamorous thing I've ever done The only, you know what it was for me was I had a terrible sinus infection when I was down there <laughs> and uh, I went from uh, living, I went from Pennsylvania, which was 30 degrees and snowing to Miami, which was 80 degrees with 84% humidity. And my sinuses were just sending me hate mail, uh, the whole time. And so I was kind of just generally miserable and, uh, then the heat and, you know, but I got to tell you, I'm so glad that I did it and that I, I gutted it out and toughed it out and, and just gave it everything I had. Because I think that when people see the results and they, and they just get a taste of the information that we are going to just absolutely, I can tell that we are going to get into everything uh, in the time that you have generously allowed me. Once they get a taste of that information, I think that's going to make them one more. And that will make it all worthwhile for me. Yeah, for sure. And I'm so excited to get into it. And you were so gracious to send me a copy of your book, autographed even. I mean, I've had people send me their book and I've requested autographs, but yours is the first. So I'm going to, I'm going to frame it. <laughs> um, oh, wow. And I had... tell you what, don't do that. Keep yeah. that book and I'll just send you another one to frame. Okay. Keep, okay. keep, keep <laughs> that's yours. You keep that. <laughs> Yeah, and you wrote some really awesome stuff in there. The key to the future is here. And also, no one ever changed the world by believing in the ordinary, which I really, really love that one. Hmm. Uh, well, thank you. I don't know if it's mine, but I like it. And I thought it really applied to you because you guys do um, great work. And I, I came to, uh, to know you through uh, um, a mutual friend of ours. Um, and... He was so on fire about you guys. And when I checked it out and uh, I was offered the interview later, I was like, oh, how could I pass this up? It's too good. So I'm very happy about it. And, and by the way, your uh, comments to me prior to the, to the show going live illustrated to me that you have read this book cover to cover, <laughs> <laughs> maybe more than once. Uh, you were able to rattle off 11 things in a row that were pertinent to our discussions tonight. And I want you to know that I appreciate that effort of someone who is going to be interviewing me on a topic or discussing a topic that is also uncommon and very much appreciated on my part. Yeah. Like I said, I started reading it and I just couldn't put it down. I was just like, Oh, I want to know more. I want to know more. And you just had so many yeah. interesting and intricate like details in there. And I know that you're really passionate about this and you've put so much time and effort into it. And, and you found the little puzzle pieces that, um, Ed had left out there. And so it was just amazing to read and really mind blowing to me. I'm like, wow, like, I can't believe this. And wow, really that? Oh my goodness. And I'm not going to give away the details right now because like you said, we're going to go into it, but I really do recommend that everybody gets a copy of this book. And, um, for the listeners out there, it's called the lead Skaldnin codex breakthroughs and understanding the coral castle. Um, it's really amazing. I really loved it and enjoyed it. And like I said, I couldn't put it down. Thank you. You know, I can tell that that's, and I can tell that's genuine. 
the, it's almost, you know, the book is only 77 pages, which seems um, very unintimidating. And I think uh, it, it almost is, is deceptive because it's 77 pages, but it's like, it's like cheesecake. You know I mean? <laughs> that looks like a small piece of cheesecake, but two bites and you go, oh, this is almost too much. And uh, that's, what, that's what I wanted to do when I read Ed's writing. And I can't believe it that, you know, English was his second language and was not his first. He spoke Latvian originally and he learned English and he was able to write English in such a style that I have honestly never seen. I, I've read doctoral theses. I, I've read Einstein's papers on general relativity. I've read the, the writings of Stephen Hawking, brilliant men. I have seen zero that can match Edward Leeds Scullman when it comes to concise writing. He did not waste a single word in his writing. And I tried to, in his name and in his honor, copy that style and give people exactly what I wanted to say in the most concise and efficient and correct way possible. Um, and my hope is that when people read the book, I hope they have the same reaction you do. I hope that they can't put it down. But at, at a certain point, you know, even when I was writing it, I was like, you know, I think this might be too much. Could this, should this have been a two-parter? Because it's almost suffocating in how much information is in there. It's a lot to take in. And I think that your listeners will be able to appreciate what I'm talking about as we get into this. Yeah, and I was blown away because um, you were talking about reading Ed's books and you actually showed a picture of the book and the actual size of it. And I'm going to show it to our Periscope peeps like, this book is so tiny. And when I first opened your book, I was like, I felt like I was going to go cross-eyed because the print was smaller than I'm used to, but it was actually very easy to read and my eyes adapted to it very quickly. Um it, it was just awesome. But that book of Ed Leedskalnin's, like, as it's called The Magnetic Current and Mineral, mm. Vegetable, and Animal Life. Um, these books are very small. Um, was it difficult to read them? Was the print really small? Or um, was it just, like, with your book? Like, you couldn't put it down? Like, what did you find yourself thinking as you're reading these? So... Uh... I, I think calling them books is, is very generous of you. They are, <laughs> barely a, they are barely a booklet. They are more pamphlets. Uh, Magnetic Current is a booklet, I would say, technically. Uh, Animal, Vegetable, and Mineral Life is kind of a pamphlet. I mean, it's like an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper folded in half. That's, that's basically it. Um, and when I started reading magnetic current <laughs> i realized i don't understand a single thing he's saying <laughs> these are either the raving these are either the ravings of a madman or the opus day of a genius and so i was like well i'm fascinated i have to figure it out and and you know i mean it the first paragraph of magnetic current is enough to make you pull your hair out it's so crazy sounding that I committed it to memory because I've read it and studied on it so much. It says this writing is lined up. So when you read it, you are facing East and everything you read about magnetic current will be just as good for your electricity. That's the first paragraph. It makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> Zero. And I, one of the most brilliant things about Ed Leeds Skullman was his ability to psychologically disincentivize people who he felt were, I, I want to say, unworthy. That if he could disincentivize you, if he could fool you, if you were assumptive 
or had any um, give up in you. He, he, this was meant to expose it. And it starts just with the written words. And I read the entire booklets over and over. I underlined things. It would take me a month to understand one sentence that he was saying. I would have to really, really think about it and say, what, what does that mean? What does that, and finally, oh, okay, I get it now. And I realized that this man is brilliant and nobody knows who he is hardly. And he's completely unsung. He, he reminds me so much of Tesla in that way. And so once I, I decided that this was worthwhile, I wanted to make sense of it. And I carried these little underlined and highlighted booklets with me everywhere in my truck. They would sit beside me on the chair. They, they went everywhere with me. And I decided that I wanted to read and understand it. But I, for four years, I had no breakthroughs whatsoever. I was just an idiot carrying around booklets with me. And one day, I'm, I'm home on Christmas vacation. And I'm sitting in my favorite chair. And I'm watching uh, the movie Iron Man. I'm a huge Marvel guy. Anyway, I'm watching the movie Iron Man. And I'm watching Tony Stark in the cave. And he's showing uh, the person he's uh, captive with his plans for the Mark I Iron Man armor. The first time he ever thought of it. And he's showing them these different pieces of paper, which just have little sketches on them, but they don't make any sense. And then he takes the pieces of paper and he overlaps them and he holds them up to the light and you see the entire design. I had the books sitting next to me while I'm watching it. And I look down at the books and I look at the screen and I look at the books because when you look at the booklets, they have one, as you know, on magnetic current, there's the perpetual motion holder that he invented and on the other booklet of animal, vegetable, and marital life, there are these two little squiggles that nobody knew what they meant. And I'm looking at the screen, and I'm looking at the books, and I do that for about 10 minutes. And then I, re I pick up the booklets, and I overlap the covers, and I hold them up to the window where the early morning light is streaming in. And for the first time in 75 years, I see what Ed saw. They fit together like puzzle pieces. They interlock. And even more than that, the first paragraph makes sense. For the first time, those crazy words are the sanest thing I've ever read. This, so what happens is, is that those two little squiggles are actually wires that when you overlap them with a perpetual motion holder on the other cover create a different device. The one he shows independently is a magnetic device. When you add those two little lines over here, what you realize is those are leads. Those are leads that are coming off of the coils. And they turn this magnetic device into an electrical device. Wow. I mean, I am not the guy I think Ed would have chosen for this. Ed was a little tiny guy. He, he didn't, I don't think he liked people very much. Uh, he was very conservative. If you, if you read his other book, uh, A Book in Every Home, he had some really strong opinions about society. And I seem to fit his perfect example of people to avoid. Um, <laughs> big, really? <laughs> but you're yeah, different I'm and big, unique. I'm... Like, he might have actually liked you. <laughs> I, I don't think he would have liked me until I spoke to him because I'm big. I'm covered in tattoos and sarcasm and, you know, I, I'm kind of the antithesis of him in, in many ways. Like the opposite. <laughs> but I, I am. I, I'm the anti-Ed, you know, <laughs> but we are but we are the same in one way that we can see things a certain way. I share that with him in many respects. And I would have just simply explained everything I found to him and, and went through and basically just spieled out what is a, in 77 pages on Amazon. I would have told him directly, and I think his opinion of me would have changed immediately.
But more than that, so the first paragraph, um, once you put the puzzle pieces together and you see how they fit and it creates the secret schematic. And by the way, you can see this on my channel on YouTube. I show a visual of this. If you go to uh, Talking to Lead Skullman, it's just as complicated as it sounds. Good luck spelling it out. But the point is, the first paragraph, this writing is lined up so when you read it, you are facing east. What happens when we face east? North is on our left and south is on our right. He is telling us the magnetic polarity of the perpetual motion holder. And then he says, everything you read about magnetic current will be just as good for your electricity. So if north is on the left, north on a battery, positive. That's the positive electrical. On the other side, we have south, and south is negative. So we now know that here's the extra piece that you need that he hid, like a key from a lock. And then once you find it, those words, the ve- and by the way, the very first words, he wanted to make sure that once you found that, the directions were immediate and available. He did not want you to have to look for them. He made it the first thing, and I'm sure when he read it and wrote it himself, he knew that that sounded very confusing and made no sense. He knew it would only make sense to the person who found the key that fit into the lock. And then that door would open. And that has set me on a trail of discovery that I feel sometimes like Ben Gates from National Treasure, you know, um, with, without the minus the rich benefactor. It's the same thing. It's you find a clue and then another clue and then another clue. And the Coral Castle is the biggest unsolved mystery I have ever seen. And and we're starting to pull that thread. And it's very exciting. Well, I was kind of gathering as I was reading, was he leaving like little clues in each book that you had to kind of put together to figure out like this riddle? So it, it was just the, for this particular part, it was just the two booklets, Animal, Vegetable, and Mineral Life, and Magnetic Current. And you can get both of those from the Coral Castle Museum gift shop uh, for just a few bucks. And you can buy the books, and you can hold the covers up, and you can do it yourself. Uh, and you can, you can see that it's true and that they line up. And I have a video that shows how it looks with the covers, and then I made transparencies of those covers so that you could see it more easily. I even took real close-ups of it, so you can see it really lines up, it really locks in, it really does change this into a different device, and, and, and he, he hit those things. Now, I, I think I know what you're referring to, Darren. I think you're talking about a book in every home. A book in every home was the, as a very small, kind of thick little booklet again, where um, it's a very strange book, because... It has his pictures in it, which I believe, and they're inside and outside the front and back covers. Pictures that he took and that he placed inside that book for people to see. My personal opinion is that those pictures all contain clues. And I've searched through them and I've found a couple. But the other odd thing is that Every other page in the book is blank. And at the very beginning of the book, he says, Dear reader, if you don't like any of the things I say in this book, you can write your own. I left a page blank so you can write your own opinion opposite it and see if you can do any better. And myself and many other people who know about this book believe that the blank page is to work out the code that is hidden on the other page that he wrote. It, it, you said it, because it's even made for a right-handed person, which is interesting. <laughs> if that's the case, it was made for somebody right hand because that, that's how you write. You would you would read on the left and you would write on the other page, and that is how you would work out a code if you were right-handed. That makes a lot of sense to me. What I haven't been able to do, and this is kind of my last big puzzle to crack, if nobody else does, but I believe that book is encoded. And uh, I have, I've been too busy solving all the other ones because <laughs> some of them are really big. 
but I want to, uh, that'll, that will be my, I think the last piece of the puzzle for me, um, is to see if that book is encoded. And if so, what does it say? I believe, uh, to use my Marvel phrase, that's the end game. It's almost as if I found them in the order he wanted them to be discovered. So I want to kind of rewind. When is the first time that you actually got to visit the Coral Castle? And did you see all these things going on? Or were you just like marveling at what was happening around you? I've been four times. Um, The last time was a month ago. The first time I went, I was a wide-eyed, naive babe in the woods. I was just stumbling through there. I was just just in awe. I just wanted to see the size and the scale and the work itself with my own naked eyes. I didn't want to see it through a television screen. I didn't want to see it on a YouTube video. I wanted my eyes to touch that structure. And so I went there and I took it in. What I came away with was the way that he says or he shows that he did it and the way people believe that he did it is impossible. I just, I just knew it was impossible. I, I couldn't articulate it at the time. I couldn't put it into words or numbers, but the feeling I had was we've been fooled here. This is a con. This was purposeful. And I left with an even greater feeling of desire to focus on these things. Now, while I was there, I did what many tourists are wont to do. And I took about 10,000 pictures of the Coral Castle. Everything. I took pictures of the underside of his bed. Like just anything, anything I could get a hold of. Mm-hmm. Because I wanted to use this time to gather all the information I could, I could get and then take it home and study at my leisure. Once I did that, oh, and by the way, when I found out about the secret schematic thing, I blared it to the universe, and no one cared at all. (laughs) No one. (laughs) My best friends were like, let it go, man. Let it go. Um, You're like, you got to listen. I know. I would tell, I, I, I'm that guy on the street corner, you know. Um, and I'll, I'll, I just shout it out to the world, and the world couldn't be less interested. So back to the drawing board I went. Looking at these pictures, I noticed something. <laughs> and it wasn't until my third trip, and it was my third trip there, the last one I made, which was years ago. I'm standing there, and it's in the morning, and I wanted to be there as soon as the Coral Castle opened. So I'm out front. I'm at the entrance sign. And as I'm standing there, I'm looking at the entrance sign in the oblique lighting of the early morning sun. And I could swear that I see something scrawled into the coral, like very kind of childish handwriting. My first thought was, did someone deface this? Because that's, that's terrible. And I said, no, wait a second. That's a word. Like, that's not, that's a word. Like, I know, I, I, I don't know what it means, but I've heard that. S P I C A. Spica. You know, I was just there. You can still see it. Spica. Right at the entrance sign, right when you're walking in, it says, um, uh, admission 10 cents, please drop below. And then underneath the little pipe that you put in there to put in your, put in your 10 cent admission, underneath that is written, very sloppily scrawled the word spica. I'm like, all right, so I, I didn't know what it meant. So I looked up the word spica. And what I found out was that it was the brightest star in the constellation of Virgo. Again, this means nothing to me (laughs) until I'm watching this guy. And I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but there used to be this show that came on at three o'clock in the morning. 
where I lived in Ohio at the time. And I, I want to say, oh, I hope I get this right. His name was Jack Horkheimer. And he used to do this little five minute thing. Um, Jack Horkheimer. And it was uh, this, it was for astronomy buffs. Okay. Which was why it was on at three o'clock in the morning because no one but astronomers would care about this. Right. But he was always, but he was always talking. He was like, Oh, and, and Jupiter is going to be in conjunction with Venus. And that hasn't happened since. And it was called star hustler. If I remember right, Jack Horkheimer, the star hustler. And he would get on there and he was this portly little guy with a mustache and a, and a blazer on. And he was very excited about the stars and he would tell you what was going to happen. If you wanted to, as he put it, keep looking up. And I remember um, Spica was the brightest star in the constellation of Virgo. And then I saw a picture of Virgo. When I looked up the word Spica, boom, up popped Virgo. And I was immediately struck by the similarity of the constellation Virgo and the first three statues on the east wall of the Coral Castle going from left to right. And, oh, now it makes sense. Again, he leaves a little clue, and then big reward when you notice. And what I noticed was that Ed carved an entire wall of constellations out of stone, going from Virgo to Taurus, from left to right. And each representation is accurate and unbelievable. So I see this and I say, okay, now I look at, this is where Jack Horkheimer comes in. Watching this show at three o'clock in the morning paid off because he used to tell you the old timers reference for how to find Spica in the night sky. And you could do this without being an astronomer or anything. And the words on the entrance sign are perfect. He says, drop below. Now, why would he need to tell you to drop below? You see the pipe. You see the emissions 10 cents. You, you put your 10 cents in. It's not hard. He doesn't need to give you those specific instructions. But when you see the word spica, the way that you used to find spica in the night sky was you would follow the arc of Arcturus, drop below Polaris, and you would arrive at Spica. Bless you, Jack Horkheimer, wherever you are. And that's when it made sense. I was like, oh, drop below. They say drop below players and arrive at Spica. And then when you walk in, when you walk into the Coral Castle through the entrance gate, it says you will be seeing unusual accomplishments. When you walk in, the very first thing your eyes meet when you walk into the Coral Castle is the East Wall. He takes you from, I mean, how much planning was this for him? Uh, unbelievable. He, he gives you the tiny clue at the entrance sign, and then when you walk through the arch, the first thing you see is what he gave you the clue about. He leads you like a child. Here, come on, here we go. There's the entrance sign. See Spica? Okay, I'm going to bring you inside. Now, see the first thing you look at? That's it right there. Follow that. He's leading you. And so I go over to uh, the constellation of Virgo on the east wall, and they call it the Mars statue, but it doesn't make any sense. They have all these arbitrary names for all of these structures on the east wall, which, by the way, is going to change. Uh, but... The first one they say is the Mars statue. Well, if you go over and you look at the base of what they call the Mars statue, it says Spica on the base, too. Written opposite, he writes small s, large p, large i, large c, small a on the entrance sign. Over on the base of the Mars statue, it's the opposite. It's, it's small s, or large s, small p, small i, small c, large a. They fit. They click like a key and a lock. They match. And so now I know, oh, that isn't Mars. That's Spica. There's Saturn in retrograde 
exactly where it would be in Virgo. There's the crescent of Virgo. And then now you're off to the races. Now it was, how many can I identify? Where are they? What do they look like? Do they make sense? And oh boy, do they ever. In fact, one of the biggest puzzles is simply what was Ed's sweet 16 because he was obsessed with that number. If you know anything about Ed or the Coral Castle, you know that Ed's favorite number was 16. And this was attributed to a girl named Agnes Scuffs, whom he was quite fond, apparently, and wanted to marry. And she rebuffed him, and he immigrated to the United States and built this castle as a tribute to his lost love. Thank you, Agnes. Now, <laughs> yeah. It's a sweet story. It's a sweet story. It's for the rubes. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's a shill. It's a pitch. It's a con. Yeah. This is not the work of a loveless man. He said he was building this for his sweet 16. And all the women went, oh, and Aww. all the guys went, oh, and <laughs> that, you know, I'm they can all relate. Video, I thought. Right. Everybody can relate to that. I'm watching a video that I bought from the Coral Castle gift shop that was about the Coral Castle. Some of it was kind of hokey, but I, I got it. I was like, oh, this is the kind of get people interested but one of the great things about it was they featured interviews from people who who went there when ed was alive that ed gave them the tour how cool is that that'd be and, epic oh you know what i wish i could give ed my tour of the coral castle and then ask him how'd i do on the test how'd i do did i pass you know because i think he liked to tell people what he wanted them to know Mm -hmm. Because I believe, and I think I have conclusively proven, that he wanted to hide all of these things until after his passing. He wanted this secret while he was alive and be in control of it, obviously. He set in place all the puzzle pieces so that none of it was missing before he left. But while he was here, that secret belonged to him. So he took carte blanche to say whatever he wanted to, to throw people off the scent. But one lady, and I liked her very much. She was an older lady and you could tell she was one of those tell it like it is. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, but when she talked about him, she had this softness and she said, he would look up into the sky and he, she said his, his voice would get very ethereal. And he would say, one day, my sweet 16 will come. Again, oh, Aww. Aww. <laughs> but those words in that scene told me everything. He looked up at the sky where the stars are. And he said, one day, my sweet 16 will come. Up at the stars, one day, sweet 16. And what I ended up discovering was that sweet old lady was right. Because what I found was not just Spica and not just Virgo and not just Taurus and not just, I found 16, exactly 16 celestial alignments that he had carved into the wall itself and just in front of it or right next to it. And he created a star map out of stone. Yet another riddle. And you're kind of comparing him to Ed. What is it? Igna I can't pronounce it. Uh, enigmatic or whatever. The Riddler. Oh, the enigmatic. Enigmatic. Edward yeah. Nigma. Yeah. Yeah. Edward Nigma, the Riddler. From Batman, I, you know, I, if I had known Ed, uh, like if I could know him in the present day, I would introduce him to comic books. I think he'd be a big fan, especially of the Riddler, because that's what he did. He was the Riddler in real life. And 
Believe me when I tell you I am no Batman. But he is the Riddler in real life. He has set in place an intellectual gauntlet is the only way I know how to describe it. That it is an intellectual gauntlet that you must make it all the way through to the end to receive the prize. And uh, these things are, are so amazing. Like I said, it's almost too much to take in. But his sweet 16 was the 16 celestial alignments that he built into the castle itself. And in the words, one day. Because when I realized that that was a star map, oh, and I know it's a map, because all maps have one thing in common. They have a key. A map isn't useful to you unless you know how to read it the correct way, how to orient the map to know that you're reading it correctly. And he created the key to the map, and it's on the north wall of the Coral Castle. Yeah, and it's kind of like that... Um... Right upside down triangle it's not quite a triangle right is that the key yeah you can it's, see it's, the alignment it's a, from it's that a peak. it's a peak right right at the top uh-huh. and they call it the crown they call it the crown on the 30 ton wall but what it is is an exact and i mean exacting um, faithful copy of a constellation called the coma bernices the coma bernices lies just above Virgo in the night sky. And when you have the Coma Bernices pointing straight up on your star map or north, you know, on a map, you will see the map the correct way. And it works out like that. You see all of the constellations and you see them exactly in the right order and in the right orientation. All of it fits perfectly together when you use the key on the 30 ton wall. And I love this. um, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, please. Well, I was going to say, I love this quote that you put at the very beginning of chapter one. And it says, the real question is not what you are looking at, but what you actually see. And that's by Mm. Henry David Thoreau. Thoreau. Brilliant. You know, I think poetry, I think I do. I think it's brilliant. I think um, poets are philosophers with charisma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is palatable wisdom, poetry. But that quote <laughs> sums up everything you need to know about Ed Leeds Scotland and the Coral Castle. It's not what you are looking at. It is what you see. And there is such a difference. It is a universe of difference. And thank you for remembering that, by the way. Um, I, that quote has driven me um, at times when everything else seems to fail uh, when it comes to making progress on this. I, I say, stop looking. See. Mm-hmm. In fact, I, I have to tell you about... I don't know, three weeks ago, I'm in my home and I'm uh, making a cup of coffee. I'm talking to my wife. And this thought came to, into my head and it stopped my heart. And I said, oh, and she said, what's wrong? And I said, I know what I should have called the book. And she said, oh. what? And I said, I should have called the book, I See. I see. Because that's all that's necessary. I see. Breakthroughs in Understanding the Coral Castle. That was the perfect title. Missed that one. Missed the boat on that. But um, when you let go of your assumptions, when you stop trying to be an armchair graduate of YouTube University, (laughs) <laughs> when you realize that there are people in this world who know vast sums more than you, when you become humble, you begin to see the world in a different way. Once I realized that Ed wasn't crazy, that he was brilliant, 
I just said, okay, I am not the teacher. I am the student. And then I could learn. Then I could see. I have had many unfortunate conversations (laughs) (laughs) with people who are uh, opposed to these discoveries, um, but, but not based on legitimate or logical scientific rational arguments, but they, they sit in their armchair and they have a keyboard in front of them and they saw a video once one time by this dude. And now they're like, Oh, it's easy. You just, and I'm like, really, it, it's easy. You just what? Because no one, no one has been able to do it since. Easy, <laughs> right? Um, right. <laughs> so, so when I, so anyway, to get back to what I was saying, the the uh, sixteen celestial alignments is a star map. But then it hit me: a star map isn't very useful, except for one thing, and it is marking the passage of time. Because celestial mechanics, we we are in the gears of a giant celestial watch. The gears turn and we are along for the ride and we can watch the passage, but we can do nothing about it, but mark it. And since ages ago, stars have been used to to mark time. So I realized that he wasn't, this isn't a place, this is a time. So now, Again, here's that. A little word on the entrance sign. And now I'm knee deep in astronomy books and I have no <laughs> friends. And, you know, uh, uh, you know. And what I had to do was I had to find out, figure out all of the alignments, where, what they are, where they are. And then I have to find out what time does all 16 celestial alignments match like a fingerprint um, in fingerprint analysis an 8 to 11 point match is considered very good a 14 point match is conclusive what I had to find was a 16 point match and my database is eternity he could be showing any time, any date, any day, any year, anywhere. So, months, every permutation, every calculation, every try, fail, 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 fail. This will discourage you. <laughs> even the even the most optimistic person will at times go, maybe I'm losing my mind here, I don't know. But I found it. I found it. And I held it up and I walked around and there was nobody there. But I still said, I got it. I got it. (laughs) And it was September 10th, 1923. It was the year he built the Coral Castle. But it was the day that struck me. We'll go back to the old lady. One day my sweet 16 will come. And on one day, those 16 celestial alignments that he had so carefully carved into the Coral Castle show up on a day when there is a total solar eclipse. It is the autumnal equinox. It is the time of what is called a syzygy, which is a very rare alignment between three or more objects in this case, four, Venus, the sun, the moon, and the earth are all in an exact straight line. All of these things happened on September 10th, 1923. And it was the day that he carved forever in stone and took the secret to the grave and told no one. Yeah, Yeah, it's truly amazing, like, these epic feats that he was able to do and create, 
and this is just a little tiny 100 pound man like you can't even imagine him doing these things and he's doing it all by himself not allowing anybody to see or help um he's just doing it all on his own and i was telling my husband about this book and he's like well, were some of these pieces underwater? And I'm like, I don't know. I'll have to ask. Were they, or were they all above water? Like, um, do you know were any of these pieces underwater that he had carved, or or were, were some of them underwater? No, he, no, he carved. Um, he carved his uh, stone right directly out of the bedrock coral of the property that he owned. He was. Um, given and uh, I believe one acre of land uh, at the original site in Florida City um, by a person who liked him a friend and said I have a lot of land here at the time land was actually pretty cheap there it was they were trying to encourage people to move into Florida and populate certain areas and this person had acquired a great deal of it and he said I will I'll give you any acre you want almost by magic Ed unerringly seemingly pick the worst acre of land in Florida. <laughs> six inch, six inches below the dirt was nothing but solid bedrock coral. You couldn't farm it. You couldn't build on it. You couldn't do anything with it. And the guy said, are you sure you want this? He said, I am absolutely dead set on this. The guy said, you know, bless you. Have at it. In February of 1923, there was an announcement published in the local newspaper that said uh, Mr. Edward Leedskalman has uh, recently acquired an acre of land and plans to build on it. Now, 1923 was the year he built the Coral Castle. The announcement was in February. It was built in 1923. The place was built in a year by a 100-pound man with no machines, no power tools, no help, and, if I may say, a, a setup and a rig which would be considered suicidal by any stretch of the imagination in regards to safety or even the mathematical possibility of being able to uh, lift and move. The, the weights and sizes of the stones that he was able to do. As far as I know, none of the pieces were underwater. However, on the property uh, that is in uh, Homestead, Florida, where he moved the Coral Castle to later, uh, he was able to dig a well. There's water under the coral, but none of the stones themselves were underwater when he removed them. In fact, you can see the quarry um, to this day you go down there and the blocks are removed like sheet cake. It's the only way I know how to explain it. It's like how you cut cake and serve it. They're just clean slices down to the exact same plane and then they are cut off cleanly and removed and you can match the size of the cuts in the quarry to the sizes of the stones that are there and they match and there's not, there's no waste. There's no breakage. It, it, they are exactly the same size as they left the quarry. Perfect. Uh, cut easily by a 100 pound man by hand. And it's amazing. Uh, like you were saying the lead skull and codex um, is about, you know, being a certain alignment in the celestial kingdom, basically. And not only does it make stones lighter, but it allows these stones to be carved and shaped, basically, kind of like they're like clay. They're softer than they would usually be. Do you think that was um, a helping factor for him to be able to carve them so easily and to move them and so on and so forth? I think it was the only way. Now, what you're saying is absolutely uh, true, but it's a bit of a, we're taking a bit of a jump here. So I, I want to tell, uh, I don't know how much time we have left for the break. Um, yeah, we but, have about a minute and 10 seconds. 
Oh, good. I can just sum this up. Then. No, I'm kidding. I'll have to wait. <laughs> it has to do with Newton and Apple and Einstein. How's that? Yeah, and it's amazing how he was able to carve these perfectly and move them on his own. And um, what was the weight of the heaviest stone that he had moved? It was only 60,000 pounds. Only 60,000. <laughs> That's right. Um, so what it is, is that Ed had a superior understanding of physics that allowed him to do something that other people couldn't do. And what I did was stumble upon what he's trying to teach us through the, the secrets that he left behind. It's not just a day or a time or a device. It's a science. Yeah, and it's really an amazing feat and for such a small man. And I hope to find out more about the secrets of Ed. Um, but on that note, we have to go to our first commercial break. So you guys don't go anywhere. We'll be right back right after these messages. Looking for nighttime adventure? Old school radio that delves into everything out of the norm. Then check us out at Spaced Out Radio. This is Dave Scott. Every Monday through Friday, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, we're going to take you on a wild ride ranging from conspiracies to true crime and every ghost, alien, and Sasquatch story in between. We're always live, and we're always interactive with you. So join us at spacedoutradio.com, where together, we own the night. Hey, guess what? You can now get your brand new Spaced Out Radio swag at spacedoutradio.com. We've brought the store back with all new items for you to pick out and pick up for yourself, your family, or friends. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, we got it all. All you have to do is head to our website and click on store. Choose what you want and it's shipped to you. The Spaced Out Radio store is right there for you. Come shop with us at spacedoutradio.com. Then we can own the night together. So you love talk radio. Then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on 24-7 with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or or the iTunes App Store. On the first Tuesday of every month, I encourage you to come along for a journey with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You. Together, we will take a look at how to access the highest expression of yourself and change your life, consciousness, ET contact, health, and wellness. We can talk about it all. So come along for a spiritual ride with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You, only on Spaced Out Radio. Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and store that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. It's going to be the best five dollars a month you're going to spend. The SOR Space Travelers, only at spacedoutradio.com. At spacedoutradio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SOR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. If you're heading to Vancouver, make sure you stop by the official bar of Spaced Out Radio, the Moose Vancouver. It's the place to party in YVR at the corner of Nelson and Granville. The Moose Vancouver is always up to speed with a kitchen staff that serves great food, all food on the menu, $6.95 to $8.95. There's a reason the Moose Vancouver is recognized as one of the hottest spots on the West Coast. Get your horns up for the Moose Vancouver. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. 
Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy on your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? A timepiece is a reflection of who you are, and what better way to show off the real you than with an Escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized Escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. We're bringing scientific thought to the paranormal. Hi there, this is Spaced Out Radio scientist Chris Cogswell. Join me, Chris Zuger, and Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month where we break down the who from the woo when it comes to everything paranormal. We'll investigate and try to bring sensible answers to those straight and sometimes outlandish questions people have. Hey, not everything has an answer, but we'll do our best. Listen in to Reality Paranormal only on Spaced Out Radio. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio, or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. You can follow Tessa on Twitter at Tessa TNT, on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio, and our website is spacedoutradio.com. Now, back to Spaced Out Weekend host, Tessa Nicole Thomas. Here's a sound again for says dancing in my head. Welcome back, space travelers. It's so great to have you listening tonight. Tonight we are joined by R.L. Poole. R.L., welcome back. It's so great to have you. Tessa, thank you so much for having me on your program. I'm having a really good time. <laughs> <laughs> me too. And and that's key to me. I like to have a good time and cover the topics, And but good time is like up on the top of my list. Um, before we go any further with these um, subjects we want, we want to cover... I wanted to get to some of the questions from our chat room and Jason was asking, does Virgo have anything to do with the latitudes it can be seen from? Very interesting question, Jason. And I, I hope that you find my answer interesting. Ed Leeds Gallman specifically gives his latitude and longitude in his writings. He tells where the Coral Castle is located uh, between 81st and 82nd degrees this and blah, blah, blah. And you can get exact coordinates of his location. And I believe this has to do with the azimuth or the angle at which you would be viewing the constellations that he left behind uh, once they were discovered. I believe that the angle and his location were very important for many reasons, but I believe one of them uh, was for how they are to be viewed once you see them on the Constellation Wall. Thank you for your question. And I know there was another one here. I'm looking to find it. Where did it go? Generally, I take pictures of these questions, but I'm using my phone to actually do 
uh, Periscope live. So <laughs> I'm not able to do that. Multitasking. Um, yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, I guess that was the only question so far. I thought there was another one. Let me look above. Maybe there was, but I am not seeing it. So I think we're good to go ahead with gravity and magnetism. Oh, boy. Here we go. All right. <laughs> Thank you. I've been dying to talk about this. Oh, all right. Here we go. <laughs> it all starts with an apple. This whole thing. And people are going, okay, he's crazy now. No, bear with me. Isaac Newton, one of the most brilliant people who have ever lived, saw an apple fall from a tree to the ground. And... Again, it's not what you're looking at, but what you actually see. Now, he looked at the apple fall to the ground, but what he saw was profound. He said there is a force, an invisible force, being applied to that apple which is pulling it toward the center of the earth. What poor Newton didn't know is what was at the center of the earth. But we do. What's at the center of the earth, Tessa? Um, a, a giant iron magnetic core. Yes. <laughs> it is what gives us a north and a south pole. It generates a magnetosphere. It, it we generate electricity from a spin. We are a magnet. And what he saw, he did not. He knew that there was a force, but he did not know what was causing the force. So he had to, he had to call it something. He had to describe it in a way that people could understand. And he did not discover gravity. He invented it. Because it was just a way, a patch. It was a, a placeholder. It was just a moniker to give a, a face to a force that he could not see or touch. He could only observe. And so he, he says it's, it's gravity. This is a, a force of attraction toward the center of the earth. Now, later, now I, I forgive Isaac Newton for not knowing this he he had no way of knowing it so when he says it's gravity he, hey that was amazing work by isaac newton just the observation alone changed the course of humanity but he he called it the wrong thing now later we have einstein who comes along who his theories are based on newtonian physics and based on the mistaken concept of gravity when it really should have been magnetism. Now, Einstein had the ability to know uh, what was at the center of the earth causing this reaction, but he did not go back and check Newton's work. He simply accepted it and then built on top of it, and therein lies the flaw. When you build your work on already flawed work, you, it's, it's completely wrong. And, and we see this. We see this because relativity, it works great in the large and the grand and the cosmic. As we get smaller, as we get tinier, relativity breaks down to nonsense. So we have to have an apologist. We have to have a correction for the system. This quantum mechanics which is the daylight savings time of relativity. It, it tries to account for all of the mistakes and flaws that you see. And there are flaws, and I'm not, I'm not being arrogant and saying that. It, it is work is flawed, and I'm not the only person who has made that assertion. Um, so we have quantum mechanics and M theory and string theory and this theory and that theory to try to explain why relativity doesn't work in certain ways. The only thing that they have to do is substitute magnetism and remove gravity, change the equations, and what you now have is a unified field theory of physics that is 
beautiful. And it is all courtesy of Mr. Edward Leedskalman, the master, the Tesla of magnetism. And this is how he was able to build the Coral Castle. I'm a big fan of um, bushcrafting, survival skills, and things like that. I've always, I've done it my whole life. I just really like it. And there's a motto that goes along with that. That says, the more you know, the less you need. Was there ever a better example of that than Ed Leeds Gallman? He needed next to nothing to accomplish his tasks. Just like the ancient cultures who did it before him. Right? We see all of these impossible structures built by people with no technology. And we go, but they couldn't do it. It was impossible. They, you know, it wasn't. They just knew more than us. So they didn't need as much as we do. When, when the nine ton gate at the Coral Castle, which is a beautiful and creative work. Well, and I heard you could gate, push it with your little finger, like your pinky finger, you could just push it and it opens nine ton door. It's true. They had, he had a door that was nine tons that was balanced in the center of the door, like a revolve, it was a revolving nine ton door that they, I, you can see footage of if you look it up and you see this little toe haired toddler, he's I think he might be three, walks up <laughs> and with one hand, with one hand just kind of stumbles into it and pushes with his hand and nine tons swings with no problem, effortlessly. Now, Ed somehow balanced that stone himself in search of the bearing himself and then hung the door himself and the door worked perfectly when the bearings rested out and they had to, and the, and the door didn't work anymore. They had to fix it. Five men, two cranes, the door still doesn't work. There's a reason for that. He knew more than any of those people. So he didn't need any of those things. And the thing that, and I appreciate you letting me bring this up and that you're interested in getting this out is that he had a more profound understanding and a correct understanding of modern physics. He understood science at a level that other people do not. And the problem is this. And and I think you mentioned this to me earlier is, what we call education is in some ways, when it is flawed, it is indoctrination, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And people go, oh, yeah, gravity doesn't exist. Yeah, we'll jump out a window. That's very funny, very droll, <laughs> but, but it's not very helpful. Yeah. You see, because we have to have, and, and Ed says this, and this is another thing, another little sentence, another little gold nugget from Ed Lee's Gorman. If we have something, we have to show that we have it. That is a scientific principle. We have gravity. Well, where is it? What is the source? Nobody knows. Stephen Hawking, the most brilliant physicist of modern times, said, we do not know what gravity is. And we do not understand its principal role in the universe. It just also happens to be the basis for all of physics. The one thing that they don't understand, can't identify the source of, and they don't know how it works, but it's the foundation of physics. Now, who are we selling this to here? This is not scientific thinking, but people are dug in. And they're not going to come out unless there's a reason to change their mind. And this is why I preach the gospel of Lee Skolner to anyone who will listen to me. Because what he is saying is that it is magnetism. And we can show that we have it. We are inundated with it. It is the water in which we swim. 
magnetism is everywhere. It is the core of our planet. It is the core of our existence. We can show that we have it. And wouldn't you know it, magnetism seems to behave an awful lot like gravity, now that I think about it. Uh What does gravity do? Well, it attracts things. What does magnetism do? Well, it attracts things. Yeah, I feel like I'm going crazy sometimes because I'm like, huh, it seems obvious once you think about it. We live on a magnet. Yes. Well, I was going to say, like in your book, you were saying it not only attracts things, but it detracts things like it pushes some things away as you're looking at the the clouds in the sky you could see that flat bottom on them it's like the earth's magnetism is pushing against them and helping them to keep the certain distance from the earth and it has a flat bottom and these fluffy bubbly tops um so that was interesting to read as well thank you what we're talking about are expressions of magnetism aren't we We're talking about polymagnetism and paramagnetism. Did you know that you can buy magnets that have more than one pole in them? They have layers of poles. North, south, north, south, north, south, north, south. In one single magnet. And this can create different effects. It can pull something in and yet repel it at the same time. We can do this with cabinet doors. (laughs) We can do it with cabinet doors. We can use uh, polymagnets, in other words, uh, many poles in them, and we can set another polymagnet opposite, and you can slam that cabinet door as hard as you want, and they'll never touch. It will pull it in and hold it, but at a distance. But we're mystified when we see it above our heads every single day. These clouds are pulled into us, but they'll never touch because there's another magnetic pole pushing them away. A refrigerator magnet. It makes perfect sense to us, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. You, you walk up to a refrigerator. It's made out of metal. You have this little magnet with some cute little thing on the front that you like. And you, you take the magnet and you place it against the refrigerator. And boop, there it goes. It sticks. But for some reason, when you change the plane of this expression, in other words, if we go from the vertical and I take my coffee cup and I set it on the table, it's the same thing. But somehow, by changing the angle 90 degrees, it becomes something completely baffling to us. I'm doing the same thing. Every time I set a can on a desk or or I lay something down, I am sticking a magnet to the fridge. We're the magnet. Earth, the fridge. You know, I, it, it's really that simple. It's the same thing. We see it everywhere. It's just different expressions. And that is the other thing I'd like to say. There, There is no gravity. There are only expressions of magnetism in our universe. When we discover magnetism, I mean really discover it. There is no limit to what we will start discovering after that. We are electrical beings. That is a scientific fact. Our brains right now are just firing little lightning bolts all through it. Our nerves function by firing electrical signals as fast as possible. Our reaction time is 150 miles an hour. Pretty good. We like all electrical things, need a power source. And we have one in our tummy. We have a bowl full of acid that we put matter into. It separates it. And we use those magnetons, those those magnetic particles that are released, just like a car battery. <laughs> you, have, you have acid in, in a box. You put zinc in there. You attach leads to it, and off we go. It's the same principle. We're magnetic. We have a north and a south pole. We have a left and a right side. All the systems that you see in the universe tend to be binary, north and south. I mean, it, it, 
once you see it, you cannot unsee it. It all becomes very clear. I'm and looking in the chat too. room, and I'm seeing Trip, and he's yeah. saying, as tempting as it is to view the amazing park through a veil of mystery, in fact, we know how the castle was built. Creating a structure like the Coral Castle today could probably be accomplished in a few months with a construction crew and modern machinery. But Leeds Scallon worked alone using basic tools like picks, winches, ropes, and pulleys. Leeds Scallon himself said that he did it using hard work and principles of leverage. The tools he used to quarry the rock are on display at the Coral Castle, and several old photos depict the large tripods, pulleys, and winches he used to move the blocks. Though the quarried stone slabs are large, they are actually lighter than they appear because the rock is porous. Remarkably, when he heard that a subdivision was being planned near his home, he bought land 10 miles away. Over the next three years, he moved the structures he had already begun from Florida City to Homestead, according to the museum's <laughs> website. But even though he's saying this, it is indeed a fact that, like, 30 tons, that's 60,000 pounds. That's not lightweight um, stone. And the chain he's using only um, lifts, what, 5,000 pounds? The, um, the five tons. Five so tons, there are so yeah. many things in there that I'd like to just absolutely tear apart. Well, look, to say it probably could be done doesn't yeah. mean anything. Sure, you could probably fly if you flapped your arms, but I doubt it. Probably could. If you do it fast enough, you might be a hummingbird, but you can't. You, no one since Ed Lee's gone has been able to replicate his work using his means. The reason is because they don't know the secret. Now, he moved the Coral Castle from Florida City to Homestead. Oh, by the way, interesting thing. Homestead, Florida, 16 letters exactly. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure that's a coincidence. But yeah, it's pretty interesting. People said, well, it was because he was putting in, they were putting in a subdivision, or he was, he was beat up by bullies, or he was robbed, or blah, blah. Yeah, okay. Those are all anecdotal stories. There is no proof behind any of them. But there is one argument that I believe makes the most sense. Ed, we have to all agree. If you read his booklets and you see his work and you see what he left behind and the things he invented and the things he did, Ed was a scientist. Ed was a scientist. And he followed scientific principles better than scientists did. It is one thing, for instance, uh, Hutchison, the Hutchison effect. Are you familiar? No, I'm not. Okay. I'm being honest. John Hutchinson <laughs> and, no, I, I appreciate it because I, I, I want to speak to you and, and your listeners, you know, and, and if you, if you don't know about it, I want you to know John Hutchison was is this brilliant guy. He's really eccentric, um, but he was videotaping himself doing these experiments and he was getting these weird effects. Metal would be like putty and things would just go straight up instead of down and, and just weird things. Got a lot of attention for a while. Oh, yeah, I saw the videos that, about that. Yeah, yeah. See, I knew if I told you, you'd remember. Yeah. The, the weird thing about it is he, has, he, he doesn't know really how he's doing it, so he's unable to replicate his results. Well, that's a problem scientifically. Mm-hmm. It is not enough to do something once and get results. To be scientifically valid and accepted in science, you have to have verifiable and repeatable results. Ed was able to get verifiable results because he did it. I believe he picked up the Coral Castle and moved it to be repeatable and therefore valid scientifically and inarguable by anyone. And it was in a short amount of time as well. Like he tell the trucker guy, hey, go to lunch. I'll get this truck loaded up, and once you come back, you can haul it to this next location 10 miles away. Um, And these stones were massive, and all he saw was this tripod in a chain, basically. Um, Right, they they range anywhere from three, they range anywhere from three to 30 tons. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also, the person who made that statement also was confusing uh, density with weight. Uh, it doesn't matter how porous something is. If it weighs 30 tons, it weighs 30 tons. It doesn't matter how many holes are in it. 
Right, um, and he so also said it, unless you use many pulleys, more pulleys divides the weight. But he only used the one, right? So far as we know. It's not true. He did use pulleys. He used uh, a series of pulleys. But here's the, here's the literal linchpin to this whole argument. They're all anchored to three pieces of Florida pine. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, the tensile strength of the uh, majestic Florida pine is not 30 tons. He has a right, uh, a, a right company hoist, which is rated for 10 tons. He's also using a chain that is only rated for a maximum of 5 tons. So the weakest link in the chain is the maximum amount of safe weight that he can lift or move. And that happens to be 5 tons. Five tons is ten thousand pounds. It is the it is one third of the largest stone that he moved. The other interesting thing is that none of the tripods are large enough to have accommodated the thirty ton stone. The stone itself is wider than the base of any of the tripods. People who make this argument have yet to show me the configuration that would allow Ed Lee Scullin to be able to safely do this. No matter how many pulleys you use, no matter how much five-ton chain you use, at one point in there, there will be too much weight resting on a single link of that chain. This is, if you are really trying to move 30 tons with this setup, it is suicidal in its approach. Right. No one. Especially the time that frame that. that he was using to load this truck. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's uh, do it at the most dangerous, crazy way possible, inefficient, and oh, hurry up! No, <laughs> no. no. that's uh, that's not at least Colin, and uh, it's also not science. This people have said, well, he could use a lever. Archimedes said, if you had a large enough lever, you could move the you could move the world. Yeah, well, he never had to move coral because if you wanted to move the thirty-ton stone. If you wanted to lift it out of the quarry. Because, and, and this is the other thing that gets me. Okay, fine. Let's say you could rig together nine tripods with, you know, dental floss or whatever, and you could, you could lift it out of the ground. Once you get it out of the ground, now what? How do you move it? How do you get it from the tripod to where it sets with frightening accuracy? Also not explained. But... If you wanted to use a simple lever to get 30 tons out, you would have to have a lever, and I've done the math. You'd have to have a lever 148 feet long. That's just to begin with. You'd have to have 22,222.22 pounds on the working end of that lever to make up for the shortfall of mechanical advantage. Not only that, but if you'd like to raise it to a height of 10 feet and get it out of the quarry, you're going to have to put that 22,222 pounds 38 feet in the air because when you get the 148-foot lever under the stone, the working end will be almost four stories in the air, and now you need to put the equivalent of 11 full-size family cars on the end of that lever. Also, you're going to have to find a lever that's 148 feet long and withstand the weight of 82,000 pounds on a single point, and then it also has to be made of a substance that is magically light enough for a little 100-pound Ed to be able to move around. Yeah, that, that doesn't sound right to me. That doesn't sound easy. Um, it well, sounds from, impossible. From what I've seen, like the tools that they have found is incomplete from the tools that he had in his working order. Like, you find all these other tools, but you don't find the massive tools that he was actually using. And that's for a certain reason, like... Like, he's the Riddler. He was hiding certain things. I don't know if he had the fore ideal of hiding these things before he got sick and went to the hospital and died. But um, we don't have the full schematic of the tools that he was using. And Trip in the chat room is saying mm. he still moved it from the original place, which he did. 
um, to Homestead, and then he says, Philosopher of Stone. Though Leeds Scotland was a private person, he opened the park in 1923 as a tourist attraction and would often greet visitors to personally show them his handiwork. Leeds Scotland was not only a hard worker, but also a self-styled philosopher and a bit of a crank who issued a series of pamphlets about his personal views on political, social, and domestic issues. One moralizing booklet, optimistically titled A Book in Every Home, complained, The schools and the churches are cheapening the girls, they are arranging picnics, are coupling up girls with fresh boys, and then they send them out to the woods, parks, beaches, and other places so that they can practice in first-degree lovemaking. Leeds Golden also opened, uh, opined that the unemployed and powerless should not have voting rights. It's not sound to allow weakenings to vote. Anyone who is too weak to make his own livings is not strong enough to vote because their weak influence weakens the state. He was clearly a man of strong will. uh, He actually said they should perish and that's all there is to it. Right. It was very cold. Yeah, yeah, and he was clearly a man of strong will and convictions who prized self-sufficiency and rigid work ethic, which is true. Like, he believed that you should work for what you do, and um, he went on to say, Lee Skolnin also opined that the unemployed and powerless should not have voting rights. It is not sound to allow weaklings to vote. Anyone who is too weak to make his own living is not strong enough to vote because their weak influence weakens the state. He is clearly a man of strong will and convictions who prize self-sufficiency and rigid work ethics, which I just read. Um, sometimes you type stuff in here and it doesn't show, so people repeat themselves. But yeah, he had a strong sense of self-worth and um, sound worth ethic and um, was really prized upon that. Like, you got to work hard to get what you're working for, for sure. Absolutely. He also came from Latvia in the 1800s. So, you know, I will forgive his political views if they do not agree with mine. Mm -hmm. But also, I think we have to take into consideration that some of these things do not seem to be important enough for someone like Ed Leeds Gallman to care enough to write a book about. These are some of the things that uh, this person is saying. Yes, he had a very good work ethic. He was a, a very prideful person. He says, I will wear gunny sacks before I will put on another man's clothes. I will not accept charity. I will make it myself or I will not make it. And, you know, I really like the fact that he held himself to his own standard. That seems to be rare these days. Um, But he held himself to his own standard, and he scratched and scraped and worked and made his own living. But, uh, you know, his political views or whatever, he was from Latvia in the 1800s. I mean, it's it's like asking someone about civil rights in medieval times. Like, I don't trust your opinion. (laughs) Right. You know, (laughs) forgive me if I if I disagree. Methinks thou dost again, protest uh, too much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, yes, he did say these things, and, and they may have been his opinions, but they also, I see these recurring themes uh, in each of these chapters. And uh, a book in every home seems to me to, again, psychologically disincentivize people because what he's saying sounds offensive and people will simply stop there and look no further. And I believe like every other thing I have ever solved, he makes it as difficult as possible to want to do it. But you have to sit there and read through the words and stop reading the words and look for the patterns and look for what's really being said. For instance, one of the subjects covered in a book in every home is Ed Sweet 16. Well, we now know what Ed Sweet 16 is, don't we? Ed Sweet 16 are those 16 celestial alignments that made the work awful sweet. And I believe that that part of the book is he is addressing 
that topic of the 16 celestial alignments, but it's given in the guise of uh, something else. It's, it's disguised. You know, there's a video I saw on, uh, I've had this video shown to me about a thousand times. Coral Castle Mystery 100% Solved. Oh. And it's a video of that. Yeah, 100% solved and, and you know, easy. And it, it's a video of that um, playing to the tourists. And he's hard at work uh, using these pulleys to lift this stone out of the ground. And How large was the stone? Go, See? It was about three tons. It was, yeah. a, it was a, a baby. It was a and baby. And the chain but no, that's all it can takes. carry five right. tons, and right? It, Right. So the three ton stone, well within the safety limit um, because he was doing it around other people. And also, this is Ed's time to throw you off track. This is this is disinformation. Uh, That's what he was. He was he was like a disinformation junkie. He was just very good at fooling people right to their face. And I think he took a a bit of pleasure in that. Uh, He shows this. And now, although this is extremely prosaic uh, in its approach, people now extrapolate this and they go, oh, see, that's how he did it. But again, they're looking. They're not seeing what he's doing. He's putting on a show because that's what he wants you to think because he wanted to control that secret until he died. And he's still controlling it to a large extent after his death with these uh, different types of, uh, I don't like to use, the, not dishonesty, it just, he, he's, he's protecting mm-hmm. this information. And I believe, you know, how hard he was about it. If you, if you can't make it on your own, then you should perish, and that's all there is to it. Well, I believe the secret was the same thing. He's like, hey, if you're not smart enough to figure this out, and, and you just believe everything I say and you just assume things that that you don't deserve it. And I think he was trying to make this information available only to the worthy. And you got to look deeper than what's on the surface. You got to look deeper. Um, One of our listeners, Del Elson from SR space travelers was asking which alignments serve to specifically specify the date of his sweet 16. Which, which of these celestial alignments? Yeah, which alignments? It's not. Yeah. So the way the way the uh, celestial mechanics works as it relates to time is that they all have to match in position, but there are several, and I can tell you what many of them are. Uh, the Moon Fountain uh, at the Coral Castle, which is one of my favorite features, by the way. I love the Moon Fountain. It's beautiful. I just, would change its name. Uh, it is. I would just change its name to what it is. It's M105, the Sombrero Galaxy. And if you look at a picture of the Sombrero Galaxy, which I provided in the book, and then you look at a picture of the Moon Fountain, they are doppelgangers. And right in the center of the Moon Fountain is a beautiful, perfect, six-pointed star. Ed had this little code that I figured out. And as it relates to celestial alignments, five-pointed stars are actual stars. For instance, on the entrance sign, it's a five-pointed star on the top of the entrance sign. Mm -hmm. And the word scrawled underneath it is Spica, which is an actual star. So he puts the code with the word, so now you get it. Well, when you go inside, you look at it, and and I saw... Uh, I looked the star map up of just the constellations themselves directly under Virgo and in front of Virgo at the Coral Castle, right where it should be, is the lovely moon fountain, which is M105, the Sombrero Galaxy, and he puts a nice, big, beautiful six-pointed star in the middle of that galaxy. This is also on the back of the $1 bill. Did you know that? Yes. You did. Yes, um, it starts with a six-sided star, and then all the rest are five side or yeah, five-sided stars, right? Or was it a five-star sided back. star, and then six-sided stars? I think it starts with a six, and then the five surrounding. If you look at the back of the one-dollar bill, and you see the Great Seal of the United States, mm-hmm. 
you will see a six-pointed star, which is composed of five-pointed stars. Mm-hmm. You see, many five-pointed stars make one six-pointed star. Many stars, one galaxy. That's the code. And you see it again, and it's on the east wall of the Coral Castle, too. And it's where the constellation of Cancer is represented on the wall and exactly where it should be. Uh, actually, in the front of the wall itself is another six-pointed star. And this one represents M44, the Beehive Galaxy. Now, many of these do not move from their current position. But when you see Saturn in retrograde in Spica, when you see um, the moon in eclipse, uh, where the moon shares are behind the Sombrero Galaxy Fountain, I know, not as cool a name, but at least it's accurate, you, Mars fits exactly right in there. Um, when you see the uh, celestial and ecliptic equators cross exactly where Leo is represented on the wall, that's where the nine-ton gate is. When, when all of those alignments are lined up, nine tons spins with the touch of a hand. Mm-hmm. And Dell is like going crazy over here in the SOR space travelers. And he's like, why don't things that are not magnet magnetic fly off the earth? And he's like, I can't even see y'all later. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So he, he's an um, engineer. So it's hard for him to wrap his oh. mind around, uh, this process. And I'm like, hold on. Like the goodies are coming. You'll, you'll hear the process here in, in just a minute because it really does make sense once you get down to it the whole mass and everything about that uh, going on with the magnetic theory. Yeah. Dale, you shouldn't run off. Um, please don't be frustrated. <laughs> yeah. It's like stick um, around. You, you get to see what's coming. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I work with engineers every single day and they are steadfast, flat footed guys on, they're very connected to the earth and, and they, they're um, methodical. And I appreciate that about engineers. They're, they're highly intelligent people, and I admire them. Um, I think we should try to be a bit more open-minded and say, let's look at what the data shows. Mm-hmm. If you'd like to know why things that are not magnetic, why they don't just fly off the Earth, I'd like for you to explain to me what isn't magnetic. Because yeah. what you're talking about really is ferromagnetism. It is the easiest magnetism to see. Okay. Isn't uh, everything like is, is... a bit magnetic? Like feathers, like everything of certain mass has a magnetism about it. You can walk by something and feel the electricity off of it. Well, I can. Like there is electricity and magnetism off everything I feel. Absolutely. But even more than that, um, let's go down another layer. Okay. It is what matter is composed of, mm-hmm. animal, vegetable, and mineral life. The cohesion of matter itself is a result and an expression of magnetism. Magnetism is what holds together, controls, and governs everything around us. It governs us. It governs our lives. Anything that you see that has mass is formed and linked together by magnetism. When we look at a magnet, what are we looking at? We see uh, something that Ed called them the individual north and south pole magnets. Okay. He says these are the smallest building blocks in the universe. I call them magnetons because, you know, I'm American and I can't be bothered. I got to have short, quick name. (laughs) I got to have something that, you know, (laughs) you know, uh, slap chop. I got to, I got to slap chop it. I got to have a cool name to put on there. And so I chose magneton, which is pretty close actually. So these magnetons, these magnetic particles, they're invisible. We feel them 
They pass through us all day, every day. They pass through everything. They can pass through uh, dense objects faster than they can less dense objects. So when we say magnetism, what we are saying is the expression of magnetism through density. Ferromagnetic materials are highly dense materials that these magnetons, while they flow through the air more slowly, when they reach that, they, they shoot through and then come out the other side and then they, they shoot through again. And, and this pulling effect, we sense as magnetism. We feel as magnetism. Now, I explained earlier how we are electrical beings. Well, you generate electricity with magnetism. Therefore, we are magnetic. <laughs> Therefore, we stick to the earth. Also, you have to consider the power of the magnet that is attracting things. Mm -hmm. You can attract anything that has matter with a large enough magnet. And we can't even conceive of the size, scale, and power of the magnet that is at the core of our planet. We have no concept, no data to wrap our head around that could give us the sense or context for the power of the magnet in our planet. We have a magnetosphere that fights off the sun. <laughs> That's how powerful it is. We have a magnetosphere that gives us a north and a south pole. We have a magnetosphere that creates electricity in the form of lightning from a spin. And we also That's have these powerful. ley lines that are magnetic. There's energy and magneticism coming off these ley lines, which crisscross, crisscross all over the world. Um, it's That's hard exactly to explain. right. And, you know, yeah, I think that these ley lines, these power lines, mm -hmm. um, what I've noticed about them is that these ley lines are, are not completely consistent. They'll be powerful at certain times and not powerful at other times. They're unpredictable because we don't know the source. Well, and it could what be due to be... solar events, basically, like lunar or solar events, like things happening in space or the universe that conduct to the Earth's magnetism. Certain times they're exactly stronger. Exactly right. Certain times they're weaker. Just like the celestial alignment that Ed shows that I believe mm -hmm. made it possible for him to build the coral castle using means that are impossible to anyone else, that yeah. these alignments can also cause other phenomena on the planet that we are tragically unaware of. And so we see these things. Uh, I talk about this in the book about like the Bermuda Triangle, uh, mm -hmm. about the Dragon's Triangle, the Zone of Silence, the, these enigmatic places on the planet where these weird things happen and we don't understand the source. They happen certain times and they don't. Imagine flying a plane in the Bermuda Triangle during the time of a uh, celestial alignment like the one Ed shows on the Constellation Wall. And imagine that the same power, the same magnetic influence that we refuse to accept uh, helped him build it um, could also work. So what does that do? Ed generates electricity using magnetism, and he uses this to fill the blocks with magnetism, and then he uses them to use this polymagnetic effect and paramagnetic effect to float the blocks out of the ground. Imagine you're flying through the air in a metallic vehicle with a large generator with a magnet attached to it called a magneto, and imagine that that same force that is helping Ed lift those stones out of the ground hits your airplane. Yeah. That's going to cause shnikes. some weird effects, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to cause some weird effects. Imagine you're sailing a 90-ton a uh, steel vessel, floating it through the water, a very conductive medium, uh, also paramagnetic. It likes to push out magnetic fields from it. And imagine you're sailing through the, the worst spot on the planet to be at that moment because of these celestial alignments creating a tributary of magnetism that is passing straight through the planet right right through you that could 
pull that ship straight to the bottom. Straight to the bottom with no warning whatsoever. No distress call. Uh, nothing to be found. It's pulled straight to the bottom deeper than we can even look. It happens to be symmetrical in its effect. For instance, the Dragon's Triangle is almost exactly opposite of the Bermuda Triangle on the planet. And here's something else. The Coral Castle is built on the corner of the Bermuda Triangle. And the uh, celestial event that he shows on September 10th, 1923, begins at the Dragon's Triangle on the other side of the planet. But I'm crazy. (laughs) Hey, we're all a little (laughs) crazy here in SOR Asylum. Uh, We line up to take our meds. But, um, yeah, there's so many things out there that, you know, once you open your mind to accept them, like, oh, man, the things that our government has been trying to teach us to make us believe is true, there's so much more outside of those boundaries. And um, it's hard for us to open up and expand our minds and and there's so many questions like they're coming in now, lots and lots of questions. And I know we only have <laughs> about five minutes before the break, <clears throat> but let me go back here um, because I have a couple open. But um, Michael McNeil from SOR Space Travelers was asking question. What do you think of the water counterbalance hypothesis? The water counterbalance hypothesis. I am. I am unaware of what this is referring to. I'm sorry. Me as well. (laughs) Okay. So um, we'll leave that one at stead and we'll kind of think about it. Um, I wanted to address real quick, if you don't mind, something you said. that, um, That people don't want to accept it. Let me tell you, I understand that this is difficult. It's a hard sell at first because people don't like to accept that they've been fooled. It's embarrassing. It's frustrating. It's infuriating that Mm -hmm. we've been taught wrong information all this time. And we emotionally invested in that. And we believed that source and we trusted that source. And that source has betrayed us with bad information. That's hard to accept and hard to swallow. And, you know, I applaud anyone who is able to have those feelings and still be a fair enough person to objectively view scientific information and say, no, we were fooled. No, nope. uh, it sucks to admit, but yeah, we well, were Well, especially wrong. when it and comes to, to begin again. the teachings from school and things that are supposed to be known to be true, and they're teaching us falsehoods, which has been proven time and time again. Like they're, they're teaching us BS. They, it's kind of like mind control. They want us to learn a certain thing, and this is what you should know, when in reality, there's other realities out there. This is not the stone cold truth. There are other realities out there that we're meant to know, but they're just teaching us this one. Um, and it is right. really and to, aggravating. And to settle on any one thing, yeah. yeah. To settle on any one thing and say that's truth, you're not being scientific. The truth changes all the time. Mm-hmm. As our knowledge increases, the truth changes. And this is just another one of those evolutions, but it's a big one. And I, I understand the people who aren't able to, to make that leap right now emotionally or psychologically. Um, but it is pretty much inarguable intellectually. So Michael recanted I, with yes. um, using water in a container as a counterbalance to lift the coral rocks. Okay. Um, what container are you going to use to hold 22,222 pounds? And then how do you get that 38 feet in the air on a 148 foot lever to lift 60,000 pounds, right. just 10 feet? No, it doesn't matter whether you use water or whether you use stone or mm-hmm. marshmallows. It doesn't matter what you use. And you, you also talked have about 22,000 pounds of it. Yeah, you could have this amount of stones on this side and lifting this amount of stones, but it really doesn't work out to the way that he did it and how quickly he did it. There's no way he could have done that on his own. And there's no way he could have um, found materials that would support the kind of weights needed to uh, counterbalance 
60,000 mm-hmm. pounds. You have to understand, you know, all of Ed's tools came from a junkyard. And I think that was purposeful. You, you said this so brilliantly earlier. You said, How, we don't even know, like, what he was using. Like, a lot of his stuff is missing or whatever. I think that he used junk so it was easy to fool people. Because if you have cool machines lying around that people go, ooh, shiny, what's that? That's going to draw attention. But you see a bunch of old rusty junk in somebody's room, you're going to go, ah, oh, they're nuts. You know, they, they don't see the value. It's easily disassembled, easy to fool. You know, and you, on the other hand, were saying, I don't think he had the forethought to think, hey, I'm going to get sick soon, so I'm going to hide these things. Like, you know, there's so many questions up in the air. Like, I think he did have kind of the forethought, like, I'm getting older, I'm getting weaker, let's hide these. Or yeah. perhaps, just like you were saying with Tesla, when Tesla was dying, the government went in, took all of his crates of information, left only three for us to see. The rest of them were sold to these other bigger corporations. Um, And the little three crates were left for us to be like, oh, that's what he was doing. With Lead Skullman, like we see, you know, the pine beams and the chain and Mm. all this other stuff. But we don't see the whole big picture because either he hid it or the government came in and took it, as they have done time and time again. On that note... Um, I'm sorry, I don't want to no. interrupt, but we do have to go no, to no, our no, second no. break. <laughs> All right, no you problem. guys, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after these messages. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. Looking for the stories of the strange and weird that you will find hard to find anywhere else? Check out the SOR Newswire on our website. Our writers, led by Captain Shirk, are scouring the world for the oddest and most bizarre stories we can find. Everything from weird crime to suspenseful and paranormal. We're working hard for you to bring you the most intriguing news of your day. Check out the SOR Newswire at spacedoutradio.com today. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Hi there, this is Geraldina Roscoe from San Francisco's Bay Area Meditation. I invite you to join me the first Tuesday of every month with Dave Scott for Spaced Out Radio's The Spiritual You. In this fast-paced world we live in, it's time for you to take some time for you. We'll cover every possible subject from powerful meditation to healing techniques to your own intuition and spirituality. So come join us for The Spiritual You. The freedom to post what you want, when you want. That's the social media freedom you need. Social media freedom is the free app in your app store. No need to worry about going to jail or being shadow banned any longer. It's the freedom to say what you feel. The freedom to know Big Brother isn't watching. It's the way social media is supposed to be. Social media freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Download from your app store today. 
You know, it's hard being the bad man of ufology, but that's just the way that I like it. This is Chris George Zuger, and I'll be hanging out with Dave Scott and SOR scientist Chris Cogswell for Reality Paranormal, the second Wednesday of every month. And our job is to break it down and come to conclusions as to what is really going on in the supernatural world. I'd love for you to join us right here on Spaced Out Radio. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. We are getting ready to relaunch the SOR Space Travelers Club at spacedoutradio.com. For $5 a month, you can join us for a plethora of features found nowhere else. Hang out in a private chat room during the show and after party. You can check out some exclusive content and a store specifically for you, as well as a private listener forum where you can post your thoughts, stories, and pictures. The SOR Space Travelers Club, coming soon to spacedoutradio.com. Do you want to know what's really going on in your world? Do you have questions about who you can trust in the mainstream media? Then look no further than the Rebel Planet. Come get the straight answers right here at spacedoutradio.com. Join me, Jamie Sexton, creator of Rebel Planet News, as I fill you in on the stories behind the stories. All you truth seekers, be sure to tune in to Rebel Planet on spacedoutradio.com the third Thursday of every month. Find your escape where time has no limits. It's about living today and cherishing the heritage of yesterday. A spirit of adventure for what is new with the nostalgia of the past. Your timepiece is a reflection of who you are. Life surrounded by beauty from the world around us to the soul within. Escapewatches.com There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us, from radio commercials to banners and social media. Have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. Hi there, this is Dave Scott from Spaced Out Radio, and I want you to come on a nightly journey. Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, every Monday through Friday, you can come hang out with me and the other space travelers. We have it all from Carl the Alien bouncing on by to those misfit gnomes causing havoc. It's three hours of fun and entertainment on those topics the mainstream really doesn't want to touch. Come get all paranormal with us at spacedoutradio.com. And together, my friends, along with our resident guitar god, Bumblefoot, we own the night. Sit back, relax, grab a drink, and listen closely. Spaced Out Radio continues through the weekend. From the mile-high mountains of Colorado to you, listening around the world, this is Spaced Out Weekend with Tessa Nicole Thomas. I love that intro. Live right now. Oh, yeah, we're live. (laughs) (laughs) I love that intro. I'm like, that should be the second hour intro, and the calmer one should be the last hour, but I love it. It amps me up for the last hour, and I'm so excited. No, I like it. Go hard. (laughs) Right? Go hard or go home. (laughs) That's right. Yeah, I'll say next time. I want to, I should come out there. We do it again. For sure. I mean, I don't know if you do that, but I thought that would be cool. If you came out here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Like the Four Corners area, it's like a major vortex and there's so many amazing things happen. And when you're talking about um, 
the Bermuda Triangle and the Dragon Triangle and all this other stuff. It's basically on the uh, 37th parallel, which goes across That's the world. Right. And the Four the Corners area. The answer. Yeah, the Four Corners area yeah. is along that line. And so there's so many amazing things happening here. So if you come out here, you got to let me know. We got to get together. I appreciate that. And I will certainly do that. In fact, you're, you'll be the first person I tell because you're the only person I know there. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. I'd show you the sights, show you around, and be like, what are you getting off this? And, man, we've done um, National Ghost Hunting Day and World's Largest Ghost Hunt every year. And uh, this year we're going back to um, basically the basics. Um and for us, it would be like the native world going back to ruins and so on and so forth. And uh, what happened with like the Anasazi, you know, they disappeared. There's no skeletal remains. Their food was left in place. Their canisters, their their vases and everything were just left there. No bones, nothing to be found. And they were gone. Um, perhaps mm. it was an alien invasion and they were taken or maybe they just moved along. Who knows? But... We've tried to get psychics on board, and they're like, we we don't want to do that because this is a vortex, and we're afraid if we do it, we're going to open it up even more, and who knows, it's going to be negative or positive, and, and so they're kind of afraid, mm. and finally one came aboard, and everything's been good so far. We haven't opened a major vortex. We haven't um, killed a bunch of people. <laughs> it's been pretty good. Yeah, my car started fine this morning. Like, everything seems okay, so yeah. good. Yeah, we're all good still. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot that's heavy stuff yeah it was interesting and in our area is a major vortex and we have so many different things happening um especially since the full blood moon basically wolf moon mm -hmm. was the last one before this yeah. worm moon and after that a lot of energy has been happening a lot of paranormal happenings have been happening we got skinwalkers we got spirits we got ghosts we got Oh, you name it, we got it. Yeah. Um, but it's been interesting. Don't so, you think it's interesting that the moon has an effect? Yes, it's the pull of the moon and gravitational pull or the magnetic pull, so on and so forth. Um, gotcha. It's been very interesting. So I, I don't know that it would cause them, but it yeah, maybe well, it does seem something. to. Like, you you know, I watch live PD a lot. That's, like, one of my guilty pleasures. And it seems like when there's a full moon happening, all kinds of crazy stuff happens. And um, especially after the blood moon, a.k.a. wolf moon, I had a lot of energy happening around my house. And I don't know if it's because me and my family are basically magnets. We have spirits who are, like, Hey, she's over here. They're over here. And so they come in because we can hear and see and sense them. And so they all come in and we're like, what the heck is happening? <laughs> it's happening again. We thought we got rid of it. But it's kind of like a, a portal or a vortex or a magnet, like you're saying. And they're just pulled mm -hmm. in because they know that something's going on here. Somebody can hear or see or sense them. And so it's pretty interesting. Well, it's like you said, you know, they're drawn to you. They're attracted like a magnet exactly we search for our binary we search for our opposite in this world you know they, they, they even say opposites attract you know my wife is a little tiny thing i'm a big guy yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm ugly she's beautiful you know like opposites attract and and that's that's the nature of everything and and it's it's a very basic concept but it's easy to understand, and it, you can see that it's everywhere. And you guys and have this. A... Go ahead. Yeah. No, 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 please. Well, you guys have this little tiny, cute little spawn that you've named after your two superheroes. <laughs> one is a Marvel. One is after Ed, right? A real life Marvel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Logan uh, is uh, the superhero known as Wolverine, and. Um, Edward leads called him to Logan Edward and uh, he is I'm, I'm speaking in my 
my quiet dad voice right now because he's mm-hmm. asleep in the next room as we as we speak, and uh, he's uh, four months old, and he brings us great joy. Aww. But I love being able to have him carry a name as uh, as important and iconic as as Edward for Ed Lee's gone. That was for him. Logan and Edward. Also, uh, yeah, so um, Ed's name was Ed Lee's calling, so Ed L, and and his name, Logan Edward, is L. Ed. <laughs> well, I'm sure he's going to be same, a, an amazing, powerful entity to be dealt with. Like, he's just going to be epic. <laughs> Nobody's going to know how well, I'll to... I'll tell you what. It won't be from a lack of love or support, I'll tell you that. If he That's doesn't. right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very proud to to be a father again, and um, it's a very joyful thing for me. And stressful sometimes, but children are a source of joy. And, they are. And... I mean, not not your not yours or anybody else's, just mine. Uh, mine was screaming during <laughs> during the middle of the show, and I'm like, man, I stood up. I'm like, man, that's pretty loud. And my husband's like, yeah, it is. I don't know what to do. And I'm like, I don't know, but you better quiet her down because. I'm in the middle of the show, and you're right outside my door. <laughs> um, so you're three minutes away from calling me, and he is crying. He's oh. hungry. And we're like, oh, okay, get it together, get it together, okay. And I'll go hide in this room, and you go hide in that room. And all in there, the phone <laughs> rings. Hi, Tess. Just very calm. Hi, how are you? I could this tell you were a little you know. stressed out. I could hear it in your voice, and I was like, uh-oh. Oh, no. Oh, wow, I'm a terrible actor. You know, you know what I should have done? Pulled out my... I should have pulled out my, my secret weapon. It was my cool, you know, English voice. And just, well, Hi, how are you? I'm empathic, so I can pick up on that stuff. I was like, uh-oh. Dang I don't it. know. I hope it's not me. <laughs> um, but it all worked <laughs> out good. We got a good flow going on. And we do have a few no, more I think we're questions. Doing good. Um, Trip was asking, Please. can Oceana Rock be dug into with a spoon? If you're asking if... Um, uh, the bedrock coral that is found at the coral castle can be dug into with a spoon. I can assure you it cannot. There are two different types of stone that were used. And um, uh, one is uh, completely different from the other. But the one thing they, one is uh, the, the first site, the Florida City site. Um, it is oolite limestone. There are places uh, when saturated with water, that oolite limestone can be um, more easily manipulated. However, the problem is in doing this in large size or weight because that same softness uh, also lends itself to weakness. And this means that it is dangerous and um, unpredictable to try to uh, move or manipulate things of great weight or size with that um, deficit in uh, tensile strength um the uh, coral at the current site is stone (laughs) it is stone and it is non-negotiable stone you go out there with a spoon you're going to come back with a nub there is no digging it out with a spoon the slats that he used uh, were uh spring steel and they were wide and he used many of them for a single stone. Now, one of the things to remember is that coral isn't just heavy and it's not just um, difficult to work with. It is brittle. It cracks. It breaks in unpredictable ways. It is painful to work with and Ed was able to do this in a way that it looks like you're you're taking pieces of cake out of a sheet pan it is clean and you know you see this in other areas uh Puma Punku Ayante Tambo you can see bedrock mountains of andesite which is again hard non-negotiable um spoon proof if you will, 
that looks like it was cut out with a laser beam. These same marks you see on the floor of the quarry of the, of the Coral Castle, you will see in ancient quarries as well. They look like they were milled out by a machine. Mm-hmm. And uh, Very precise. It is, I mean, uncanny. It, it, as soon as you see it, you say, that doesn't look right. That looks too good to have been done by people with copper chisels and chicken bones and wire, and they didn't have the wheel, but they had the ability to cut stone like it was done with a laser. And no, it wasn't done with a laser. <laughs> I know I know. people will go, aliens came down with lasers and helped them. No, uh, it looks like it. I'll give you that. It looks like they did, but they didn't. Uh, one of the things is a lack of vitrification on the stone, which is caused by high heat. But the other is, is that, you know, there are other ways. And the way that Ed found seems to make the stone not just lighter, but it also seems to make it softer. And this is evident by the wedge marks that you see in the stones, that, uh, the blocks that line the walls, that form the walls of the Coral Castle. You see these wedge marks that go in. And the thing that struck me right away is, um, as someone pointed out earlier in their comment, they said, uh, it's porous. That mm-hmm. is true. When you see the slide marks, or I see slide marks where the wedges went in, which is strange because it shouldn't be slide marks. That's for something that's wet and soft and compressible. Mm-hmm. And also, when you see the wedge marks, you don't see pores anymore. It's been pressed in. It's been displaced. It hasn't been chipped away or broken off. This has been pushed to the side by a steel wedge in a way that compressed the material instead of removing it. This suggests to me that it was the consistency of clay. Again, I know that sounds crazy, but consider what we're talking about, magnetism, the expression of magnetism, the same magnetism that could uh, break the bond of the stone with the earth could also break the bond between water and coral and cause them to combine and i think you know just instinctively if you do the math of water plus coral i think that comes out to somewhere around clay Mm -hmm. Uh, now i know that isn't a real argument but i think you know where i'm going with that is that water and stone clay it's 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 um it's not as soft as water or as hard as rock if you go right in the middle I, I think you get clay, and that seems to bear up under the physical evidence that is left behind when you see displacement, compression, the change of, of uh, texture. You see slide marks. It looks like somebody knocked these wedges in like you're putting a yard sale sign in your front yard. Ed was a little guy. You're telling me he's swinging a, a sledgehammer on a, on a spring steel wedge and driving it by brute physical force, which he did not possess, into solid bedrock coral to the point that he could break pieces off and do it with surgical precision. I, I just don't, no one has ever been able to do it. You know, um, for the people who say, oh, it's easy. Ed just did this or Ed just did that. Then what's holding you back? Let's see it. And no one has ever been able to do it. Well, we're also talking about, you know, these red rocks in the past and other megalithic uh, structures where they're hard granite or red rocks or whatnot. There are these little indentations and carvings and so on and so forth, which looks like it was just of a clay stature when in fact it's harder than that. Um, today and for the longest time it's been that way but still they were able to manipulate it in a certain way and put these different carvings and such in it which today you couldn't even wrap your mind around you couldn't even do it right we can't replicate their results and you know i see what you're talking about these indications little clues that i see in all ancient megalithic structures even the pyramids you know i look at the i love obelisks I think me and David Hatcher Childress are the only two people who really care about obelisks. I love them. I think they're beautiful. And when I look at them, you see some of them like at the, what is it? The, uh, is it the Temple of Set? There is one that is 
beautiful. And it is carved exactly the same with hieroglyphs on each side. And these hieroglyphs go all the way to the top. And they're large, impressive, beautiful hieroglyphs. And the other thing I noticed is that they are all exactly the same. That's a clue. These are deep, detailed impressions in hard granite. This isn't mm-hmm. sandstone. These are granite. Yeah. Non-negotiable. And what I believe is the same trick that Ed used to put those wedges in that compressed the, the, the material to each side of the wedge. I believe that they were able to create like stamps. And they were able to stamp into the stone while it was still soft. And that's why they're exactly the same on each side because they just carved a stamp and then used the same stamp on each side all the way up. When you see uh, a Yante Tombo and you see these large, weird, melty impressions, the stones look like they were putty and they were formed into place. They're rounded, they're pillow shaped and they're, they're in weird, crazy cuts that no one, not, not the best stonemason on earth today, would even attempt in their wildest daydreams. It's just not worth the time. These J cuts, a stone that has 13 angles and all the other stones are fitted perfectly around it. These things are insane uh, from any context except it was easy. They just pushed them together. It, they just stamped into it. When you see uh, these giant walls in temples in Egypt and they're excise carved, not incised, not into the stone, but they carve the stone away around the forms on the wall. This is mm-hmm. showing off. This is showing off. Right. This is bragging. You know, that you carve everything away but what you want them to see, and it's a perfect flat wall that you carve, and they leave the shape outside. That's showing off. This was easy. This was easy. Ed Ed may have had to do a lot of prep work, but I think the least amount of work he did was when it came to stone moving time. He had to set those tripods up in the hot Florida sun, he had to get those chains rigged to that hoist, and he had to run wires, and he had to do. He worked his butt off until the Sweet Sixteen, because that's what was so sweet about it. <clears throat> sweet also means easy. It was mm-hmm. the it was the easiest part of the time. This was celebration time. This was magic time, when the stage is set and everything is prepared. And the last cog falls into place. That's when Ed could really enjoy his work. That's so awesome. And I I just, I wish I could have been there to see it when it happened. If I I ever get a time machine, you and I should go back and and (laughs) check this out. (laughs) (laughs) And do me a favor. When we go back and check this out, when we're on our, when our, we're on our way back, I'd like to stop and fix a couple things of my own. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I wanna, I'm just going to stop and tell myself that, you know, ice cream isn't everything. You know, that's just going to save me Are a lot of trouble. Are sure? you sure? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure. My doctor seems sure. So, oh. you know. There's protein in it. Not. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I had a problem with ice cream and uh i don't anymore uh, i've lost uh, about 24 pounds in the last month and a half well i gotta uh, tell you yeah. i i was going to the rec center um during the summer and every day after i go to the rec center i'd go and get ice cream and i was losing 10 pounds per week so i'm like i'm not so sure that ice cream is bad as long as you you got that yin and yang you're swimming you're working off the calories you go to get the ice cream, which has the protein in it, and it works together yeah. to work off those pounds. If you're just watching Marvel movies or whatnot and eating ice cream, I could see how that could be <laughs> deficient, but it was positive for me. Now, see, if uh, we needed to build an ice cream castle, I could do that myself with a spoon. I could do that. Hey, I just um, I just tapped into to a bunch of sprinkles, you know. <laughs> That's right. Rainbow sprinkles. Anything Rainbow else? Sprinkles. I'm sorry. 
chocolate sprinkles. But I wanted to talk about the um, the thing you said about Tesla. You know, it's oh, I love so Tesla. weird to me. I do too. It's so weird to me that every single time I am interviewed about Ed Leedskalnin, Nikola Tesla makes his way in. He mm-hmm. he's always compared. There's always some analogy to Tesla. Now, the difference, I believe, um, I mean, notwithstanding their interests or accomplishments, was also their their death. Um, Ed Leedskalnin became sick. Um, he he had a uh, kidney infection. But I believe he he knew he was sick uh, before he left. In fact, he even left a note said uh, went to the hospital, and he uh, I believe took a took a bus to the hospital where he later um, ended up passing away in 1951. Before he left, he had the opportunity to disassemble any machines he had created to hide anything he wanted to hide to make any final plans for the future of research at the Coral Castle to discover his secrets. He could hide what he wanted. He could fix what he wanted. He could disassemble what he wanted. And he was in control. I think that that also after he passed away and people knew that the castle was unguarded, it was sacked for lack of a better word, it was raided and people took things either as mementos or as maybe future valuable things, um, whatever it was. They, they took what they wanted because no one could stop them. And by the time it, it was discovered these things were gone, it was too late to even know who did it. With Tesla, it seems different. Tesla was a very old man when he died and when you have someone that intelligent it is unique and it is also dangerous in a way because I think I would not want that person to pass away without me knowing about it and being able to secure the intellectual property that could possibly be used against you as in weaponry or technology, things like that. So somebody proffered the conspiracy theory to me that, that Tesla was murdered. And I'm like, why would they murder a guy who had, and I'm sorry, uh, one foot in the grave and one on a banana peel. I mean, he was not long for this world. He was going to be shuffling off the moral coil pretty soon. Why even bother? And then it hit me. You want a controlled circumstance, right? You want to make sure he lives as long as he possibly can. But when you see that it's about to happen, you control that. Yeah, they waited. And you go in. They, they wait, waited. and then they. Yes. They yeah. They basically blocked it off to where nobody else could get in there. They took everything they wanted, and then they left those three crates. And they're like, "Okay, you can come in and examine right now." Um, he had tons of crates in there. And then you're only left with three. Give me a break. And just like with Ed, you know, he had so much technology as far as, you know, his thought process and such. All you have are these, you know, pickaxes and all these basic tools. You don't have the whole scope of what he was using. And so it's still a mystery to us because they took it. And I think the government keeps tabs on you, knows what you're using, knows what you're not. And then... Once you're past, they block it off, they go in, they take what they want, and they leave the rest for us to examine and think, oh, well, he was just using pulleys and levers, and that was it, when it really wasn't. Well, I I have two things to say about that. One, if that happens to me and they find three crates, two of them are are fake. I will Mm -hmm. never produce as much work as this man in my entire life. (laughs) Um, But uh, the other thing is, is that, I want to make this really clear. It wasn't about the machines he used. It wasn't about anything he built that that was disassembled or they took. He was smarter than them because he left it carved into the coral castle itself. His technology wasn't machinery. 
it wasn't technique. You know, it was it was physics itself and a superior understanding of it. It was a new and revolutionary way to see the world and the universe and the forces that govern and control existence itself. And you're also saying in your book how, like, magicians, you know, show you this certain way to do it, but there's actually this other way. And just like Ed showed you these videos of how he did it, but there was actually this other way that he did it. You know, he's trying to show us close-minded people how he did it, but the people that are really looking to find the key to it realize there's more to it than what meets the eye. He he was the... uh... I want to say he was like the opposite of a magician because a magician will do something that's in a a prosaic and mundane thing, but they'll present it in such a way that it looks magical, that Mm -hmm. it fools you. You go, oh, but it's all prosaic and mundane. I know this because I used to be a magician years ago. And um, magic is fun to watch and boring to do. And (laughs) he was the opposite. He was a person who could really do magic, but fooled you into thinking it was prosaic and mundane. Mm -hmm. He did the opposite. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. Anybody today who had his abilities and his insights would be doing it on live television 24 hours a day, waiting for their Nobel Prize and their giant uh, endorsement deal. He hid it like he was ashamed of it, hid it. (laughs) <laughs> and and was able to do it in such a way that, like a magician, you fool most people. It takes another magician to see through it. That's right. Whenever I look at something at the Coral Castle, whenever I, I because I, it's also having insight into his psyche. I, I kind of have a sense of how his mind works in that way because whenever i look at something now it's always viewed through the air of suspicion i always go okay what are you really what is that really and i dig to the bottom until i hit bedrock and then i usually arrive at an answer that is not what you would expect well eric and, in the chat room was asking question could he have set the police and chains up to trick people so they wouldn't figure out his secret Yes, I think that's actually... So, uh, again, we go back to the video, one Coral Castle Mystery 100% Solved. They show him lifting a little three-ton stone. Easy, right? So then they extrapolate that to mean much more. And, yes, he did set things up to look a certain way. This is obvious, because the, the equipment he had couldn't do the job. I mean, it's scientifically, physically impossible. And... I only say that because no one's ever done it. Well, Tripp was okay? saying, That's here my... are the tools he used. Coral rock is very light and easy to carve, even with a spoon. I worked with coral rock. And where's your castle, sir? I'd love to visit <laughs> it. Um, Eric if you have is... a 30-ton stone that you dug out with a spoon, I am coming and I want an autograph. That's right. Um, Eric was asking again, does RL believe in hybrids or ET interventions? Okay. This is a complicated question. I saw something one time that I was like, you know, is it? Because... I bought a bunch of stuff for, you know, on one of the visits to the Coral Castle. I just raided the gift shop and I just got one of everything, um, you know, fanboying out at the Coral Castle gift shop. And I'm spending my my child's college fund on on my present needs. And one of the things I got was I got all of the postcards, all of the uh, paper paraphernalia that they sell. A lot of these are um, postcards that are made from photographs that Ed took himself with his Browning 616 camera. He would often uh, set it at a distance, set the timer, and then he would uh, position himself somewhere in the Coral Castle and have the picture taken 
I saw that he often positioned front. in front of the the um, planets that he had carved. The constellation wall. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things that I noticed in one of the postcards, and I still have it. I have a whole like scrapbook of all these postcards and everything. But in one of the photographs, there's something very odd. And in this photograph, it is Ed standing um, at the, the constellation wall. And he is looking in a, in a direction that is not at the camera. It's the only one I've ever seen where he wasn't looking at the camera. And what looked like at, at first blush, when you look at it, you think, oh, these are, these are shadows here, dark uh, outline shadows. But then when I'm looking at it, I realize, well, from, from the direction of the light, that can't be true. And I've been there many times and the shadows are not cast that way. And I, I grab a magnifying glass and I start looking and I have to tell you, and this may sound crazy. It looks like two figures standing there, silhouette with largely proportioned heads and in, in relation to their body, you can see a body outline. I can even make out what seems to be, the curvature of fabric oh, on wow. the bodies but they're all black like silhouette like it's hard to describe it's like if you had a material that absorbed light but did not reflect it if you can imagine what that would be yeah um that's what these bodies these two bodies, and there there seem to be two standing side by side and they're standing in a way that appears that they are facing toward Ed. And that it's, I believe, I, I do believe that it is possible that maybe he was let in on a secret. I think that it's possible that the Egyptians were let in on a secret. You know, I think Tesla we was about, as well. And Einstein. Yes, he said, we are receivers. He said, we're receivers. He yeah. did not say who the senders were, did he? No. That's too complicated. But we see, you know, Eric Von Daniken talking about interactions with the gods of ancient times. When we see, you know, 2,000 years ago, if I went back in time with a Zippo lighter, I rule the kingdom. I, am <laughs> I have all fire I in my hand. I am Lord Zippo. You will worship <laughs> because I have a technology that they can't even imagine. A Zippo lighter. If you brought somebody from the 1400s and you took them to Walmart and you walk them through the parking lot and the door magically opens in front of them. <laughs> Unbelievable. Now, take that, those small little examples of really mundane technology today. Now, yeah. take those same people and land a UFO and get out. You're you a god. You came from the heavens. You came from the heavens. You might as well be. You know, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a god. You might as well be because you are compared to these poor pitiful creatures. And, you know, you stop and you like them and you're like, oh, they're nice. Look at them. Poor little pitiful guys. Tell you what. I'm oh, bless their pointed the heads. <laughs> yeah, but, but we're going to give, you know, what if they just gave us the equivalent of what is their, like, Boy Scout technology of, hey, I'll tell you what. I can't give you any technology. I can't... Um, I do it myself for you, but I tell you what, if you wait till this lines up with that and this lines up with that and you're over here, then do this. Watch what happens. See you later. It wouldn't I'm, take much. I'm trying to get back to these questions in the chat room and Michael McNeil from SOR Space Travelers was wondering, what ideas does Mr. Poole have about how Ed lifted the coral blocks? Okay, so thank you. Um, and please, RL, I like to, I like to keep it informal. Mr. Poole makes me sound more important than I really, really am. Makes My me want to go swimming. He... <laughs> <laughs> uh, my theory is that he used a combination of water, magnetism, electricity, and a radio frequency in conjunction with these celestial alignments when the time was right because where ed happens to be 
during the time of this very important alignment, and the reason I believe he gave his exact uh, ge- geographical position is because he was on the exact opposite, on the outside, in the center of the planet. From, like, if you go from left to right in your mind, you go Venus, the Sun, the Moon, and then the Earth on the very right. Now, if the Earth's on the very right, go all the way around to the exact back of the Earth. That's where Ed was, which is the exact opposite side of where all this was happening. And if you look at the trigger mechanism of a Gauss rifle, you will see the same alignment. You will see a ball bearing, a giant magnet, a ball bearing, and a ball bearing. And if you go Venus, big magnet's the sun. Next ball bearing is the moon, and the other ball bearing is the earth. You see this. You see the same alignment. And a Gauss rifle is a, is a magnetic rifle. It has no uh, work. There's no propelling. It uses magnetism to speed the projectile along. The trigger mechanism works like this. Where Venus would be, or over on the left-hand side, that ball bearing is attracted to the magnet. That magnet now pushes the next ball bearing into the other ball bearing, and they keep going down this line. There's this push that goes from left to right from this alignment. That same alignment is done with celestial objects. Remember, Ed Leedskalnin says in his written works, he says it more than once, the Earth itself is a great big magnet. Mm -hmm. And he's right. There's no arguing that. Now, extrapolate that. If the Earth itself is a great big magnet then all other celestial objects to one degree or another are also giant sphere magnets. Now, when we see what we can do with sphere magnets with a Gauss rifle, then, and you see the same alignment of celestial objects, magnets, magnets, alignment, alignment, push, push. It's the same. It's the exact same. He's just saying, think bigger, think bigger. The same... As above, so below. If the same thing works here in the small scale, this is the big scale of it. All you have to do is know that they're magnetic as well. And then, oh, ah, I see what you're doing. Oh, I see why there's ley lines. Oh, I see why that happens. Oh, I see this. It becomes, it becomes easy to understand. Um, so I believe that he was able to use a combination of things that are simple technologies that would break the magnetic bond or cause or exploit this condition that arises. Imagine the heaviest stone that he ever moved was 30 tons, but the rig that he had was only rated for five tons. Imagine if you could trade magnetism with another celestial body, like say the moon, just throw it out. Just for example, just, just for the heck of it, the moon, how much gravity does the moon have in relation to the earth? To one sixth. I would be much thinner on the moon. I don't weigh very much there because it's only one sixth the weight. Now, if you take 30 tons, one sixth of that is exactly five tons the maximum amount that rig is rated for. And once you're saying that, like, it reminds me, like, I wish we had a whole nother hour because we didn't even get to the Polaris telescope or the ancient computer. Um, man. Oh, the Antikythera device. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like, I wish we had a whole nother hour. Um, if you're up for doing the after party, we have a whole nother hour, but due to this show, we only have about, Oh, shnikes. Um, another, what, uh, 14 minutes left? Um, which brings me to another question. Well, yeah, sure. Uh, BTO, Beyond the Omniverse, was asking, how long did it take um, Ed to move these stones, and how far was the distance between the original location and the other location? And secondly which was thirdly, basically, do you feel that he had galactic assistance? So, um, first the question, stories of how long it, yep. yeah. First question was how long did it take him to move these stones? Second okay, question, the anecdotal information. Uh, let me do one at a time, please. If you don't mind. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. How long 
anecdotal uh, accounts say that it took him anywhere from two weeks to a year. So there's no real direct information. Uh, I don't believe it took him very long. Just based on the consistency of, of all of the stories, he could get that truck loaded and unloaded pretty quick. Yeah, he himself. told the guy, go to lunch, Unaided. I'll have it loaded. He came back from lunch, it was loaded, he took it. Right, and that that part of the story that you just said remains consistent over all the anecdotes. So I think that it wouldn't have taken him very long if you count up the number of stones and the amount of time that it would have taken. I think between two and three weeks would have done it easily. Okay, so Next second one. question was, how far was the distance between the original location and the other location? Was it like 10 miles, I believe, right? It's around 10 or 11 miles. Yeah. And actually what he did was he actually moved closer to the Bermuda Triangle, closer to the Tropic of Cancer. Closer uh, to the that next magnetic stop pool. After, correct. The next stop after Homestead is, I believe, water. There's not much left between Homestead and the ocean at that point. So he got as close to the line of the Tropic of Cancer as he possibly could. Okay. And the third one was, do you feel that he had galactic assistance? Well, I believe he definitely had celestial assistance. Um, I don't know what you mean by galactic assistance, though. Does that mean uh, does that mean extraterrestrial influence? Yeah. Or, um, I I think that it is possible, but I really don't have any strong information to base that on. Um, I go by again the past. We we talk about the gods and and you know the same gods that could have told the Egyptians or or the Mayans or you know the you know the, the Peruvian people whoever it was. Somebody had to kind of clue them in on that, I think. And they, this information was given to them by sources higher than themselves that came from the heavens and had wonderful information and and told them things and were wise beyond our wildest dreams and maybe dropped a couple hints our way. Um, one of the issues is that that information seems to, until Ed had gotten lost, um, the, um, the secret keepers were compartmentalized and few and time has uh, eventually spread them. So then that there was no one left to carry the secrets forward. Ed had to go back and reverse engineer it. I think. And I don't want to take any credit away from Edward Leeds Gullman. Everything tells me that his mind did a lot of the work. If he was given assistance, I believe it was like a nudge. I don't think they had to write it down on a napkin for him. I think a nudge is all you need for him. Um, but I don't have any evidence or any, I don't have any way to substantiate that. It's just kind of a gut feeling I have that I think maybe they were interested in him. <laughs> I I am. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe they were too. Well, not um, only him, but, but I don't know. Um, you know, like you were saying, Tesla, Einstein, there's so many different people Brom. that they were interested in that they were sending messages to and they were able to filter it out to us. So it's interesting how they pe pick these people and they're able to give us these messages, which I believe is true. You know, it's happened time and time again. Uh, the, the best truth often comes from unexpected messengers. Um, I, I, I find myself to be a very strange messenger for Ed. <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm who he would have chosen at all. Um, but well, we you never don't are the... The vessel that we think we should be, but the vessel is what it should be, according to them. Hmm. Nicely said. Uh, you know, Brahms, uh, composer, he said, I, I don't write the music. He said, it is, it is given to me, and I write it down. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was a medium in that way, which I think is a beautiful word. He was a medium. It flowed from wherever it came from, through him and out. He was he was the faucet from which the water came, but he was not the source of the water. 
And, you know, that's, that's a great way of looking at it, I think. And, and that's how I feel about uh, Ed Lee's calling this. I, I, I'm the faucet, but I am not the source of the water you need. So I'm Trip just is, the means of saying it. Yeah. And I think you're an epic vessel. I think you're doing a wonderful job. Um, but Trip is coming through and he's saying, this is from Coral Castle's own website, Coral Castle Museum. How did Ed move all these carvings a distance of 10 miles? Ed had the chassis of an old Republic truck on which he laid two rails. He had a friend with a tractor move the loaded trailer from Florida City to Homestead. Many people saw the coral carvings being moved along the Dixie Highway, but no one actually ever saw Ed loading and unloading the trailer. The coral walls weighed 125 pounds per cubic foot. Each section of wall is 8 feet tall, 4 foot wide, 3 feet thick, and weighs more than 5.8 tons. Mm, going. I'm sorry, is there a question? No, that was just a statement. And oh, okay. then BTO was asking, oh. so does RL feel that this universe is based on electromagnetism? Magnetism is the source of everything, including electromagnetism. Electricity is simply magnetism put together. Magnetism is electricity torn apart. It's however you want to look at that. But the source, and this isn't according to RL, this is according to ED, Mr. Ed Leeds calling. This is according to him. He said that magnetons, the unipole um, magnetons, are what create and allow and form everything. It is the base element of the universe. We, they're everywhere they inundate everything mm -hmm. and this is what causes electricity to be possible this is what causes life to be possible this is what causes light and heat and every phenomenon that you are aware of matter itself is held together and then later destroyed by magnetism he talks about the construction and destruction period of all life and the cause the the disease and the cure are the same thing. Magnetism, the thing that keeps us alive, will eventually kill us and break us back down again. And we will come back as something else. And we will come back in something else. And we, this cycle will repeat endlessly because magnetism is immortal. And I was amazed to hear about even photosynthesis. Like, plants have been grown in the dark. And it's just the magnetism that keeps them growing. Because plants have been grown in the dark to do this scientific method um, and they still grow. They don't have the light of the photosynthesis, but they have the magnetism and they continue to grow. Um, Trip was Correct. saying, still stumped on how a non-magnetic item can be manipulated by magnets. Everything is mag magnetic. We all have energy. All these items mm -hmm. have energy within them, so we have magnetism within us. Even plants and trees and animals. If there is matter and it has cohesion, it is because of the magnetism within it that is holding the structure together. When you say non-magnetic, what you're really saying is ferromagnetic. In other words, the obvious, the easy to see. There are subtle forms of magnetism that we are so willing to overlook and so willing to dismiss, but everything that has, that is composed of matter and has a structure is intrinsically held together by magnetism itself. And if it is held together by magnetism, it is by its very nature magnetic. It is the strength of which it is magnetic. And some, believably, is undetectable to us in, the, in our interpretation. So what we do is we say, oh, that's not magnetic. That's gravity holding it down. No, it's not. It's magnetism that is too subtle for you to notice. And that brings me to, like his next uh, question, anyone ever get a shell in beach sand, basically crushed shells to stick to a magnet? And that's what you're basically saying right now. Right? I'm sorry to say that again. I missed that. He said, anyone ever get a shell and beach sand 
basically crushed shells to stick to a magnet. Like within our realm, yeah. we have certain magnets. Um, but are there other magnets c that could make those actually stick to a magnet? Get a few uh, little grains of sand, sprinkle them on a counter where you can see. Take a hard piece of rubber, rub it on your leg. Get it really warm. Take that rubber and then push it toward the, the grains of sand. They'll move. They're being pushed by the magnetism that you've just created. It, it, everything in one form or another is magnetism and has magnetism. When we see ferromagnetism, what we see is a dense object that magnetons pass through super quickly, and this pull is felt as, as tangible magnetism. When we see a glass sitting on a table, we are witnessing a different kind of magnetism. It is simply the magnetism of the, the magnetic energy that holds the structure together being pulled toward a larger magnet. It does not conduct magnetism. It simply possesses it. And there is a difference between the type of magnetism that attracts and the kind that is passive. And, and this is what I believe is hard for people to kind of get past and understand. But once you do, everything else seems to open up after that. Tripp was also asking, then what were they aligned to before he moved everything again? Did he wait for that next solar event before he moved the stones to the secondary place? It seems as though these alignments are not as few and far between as you might think. The problem is timing. Of course, you have to have this planned out, and you have to do all your prep work ahead of time, and you have to be aware that it's coming. So that way you can prepare and be ready and then move at the time when the time is right. I think that it only takes a three-point alignment, the sun, the moon, and the earth. I think that's all you really need. Yeah, that triangle. Uh, again... The triangle, it is uh, the, it's almost like the moon is a, a filter that like flips the um, magnetic polarity on the opposite side of the planet. Yeah, it even pulls the, the ocean, you know. Right, it, exactly. It, it, they're being magnetically pulled or pushed, mm -hmm. depending on how you want to look at it. Yeah. But... But the point, the thing is, I don't have all of the answers. I have some of the answers. I have some of the answers. But they lead to bigger, harder questions like this. And I what I need is, is support. What I need is, you know, I, I, need, I need the resources and the support to be able to study this, to find those, the answers to those very interesting questions that I'm being asked. Yeah, There's, and we have uh, a ton this. more. Like, Joe is like, aren't Ed's blocks limestone and coral? Those aren't magnetic, but it depends on the mass of the thing, and everything's magne magnetic. I'm, I'm getting tongue-tied. Um, but they are magnetic. But we are at the end of our time, so, RL, um, share with us your YouTube channel, your websites in which our listeners can find you and ask you more questions. Sure. Um, thanks again for having me on, Tessa. Um, if you go to my channel, uh, Talking to Lead Skullman, just type that in the search bar or just type in the name RL Pool and you will see me and you can subscribe to my channel, watch my videos, and you'll see more in-depth explanations of these things, which might help you give, you give you more context. If you'd like to get a hold of my book, go to Amazon, type in RL Pool or type in the Lead Scalming Codex, and you can buy my book, and you can get it in digital format or paperback. If you buy the paperback, you get the digital book for free because I want you to have the paperback. Believe me when I tell you one day, you'll be glad you did. And I want to encourage everyone, please look into this more, research it more, support people who you believe are doing good research and giving you real answers. Support people like Tessa, and Spaced Out Radio, 
who give people like me a voice and allow you to ask those questions and get some answers. And thank you, everyone, for your time. I want to thank you so much again for being my guest tonight. And that was so wonderful having you on the show this evening. And even though I've read your book, you've opened up my mind even more. I couldn't believe it, but you really did. And I'm so glad that you were here you. this evening. Me too. I wouldn't have missed this again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I want to thank you, everyone in Space Out Radio, Facebook, Spreaker, Twitter, Paranormal Radio, Talk Stream Live, Deep Talk Radio, and wherever else in the universe you're listening tonight. It was my pleasure, and I had a wonderful time this evening. It was my pleasure, literally and figuratively, and I can't wait to do it again tomorrow night on space.radio.com. You guys, until next time, nighty night, love and light to all my space cases out there. You guys have a wonderful Sunday. I'll see you all back here tomorrow night. And don't forget, we are all in this together. Together we can make the world a little better. And together, my friends, we own the night. If you guys want to come in to the after party, the number is 970-335-9596. That's 970-335-9596. Take care of my yous. I'll see you back here on the flip side tomorrow night. Oh.